right. Perfect timing, Carmen. And uh, hey, uh, good evening, everyone. We have already uh, come out of our executive session and uh, we're ready to go for our May Day, May 1st, 2023 regular session of Village Council. Um, so I'm going to entertain a motion to move back into our uh, regular session. Oh, second. Okay. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All right. So I think uh, first on the agenda is to um, talk about some announcements. And I think, Josue, you had a few, right? I do. I have a few. I'll start off with uh, the black. This wow. is the uh, national certification of reliable public power. So we were awarded uh, reliability for our work on keeping the lights on. So we got it again this year. This is the fifth year in a row that we've got it. So something that we're really proud of. So, so I brought three other plaques. I couldn't bring all the <laughs> plaques, but I think this this speaks volumes to the work of our public works team, also of us up here, because we may we help make sure that that also happens that they have the resources to be able to do the work that they do for our community. So thank you for your support. And there's Johnny. All right, look at that. All right. Keep clapping. Reliable. See? <laughs> All right, that's the that's the first announcement. Um, the second announcement is that uh, do you know what today is? Today, in addition to May Day, is yeah. the first day of spring cleanup. Oh. So that means you can put out all your treasures uh, for other people to find. And if uh, they don't take it, then Rumpke will. So we have instructions on our website, on social media, on the rules to follow for spring cleanup. So check them out. OK, that's it. Great. Uh, any other announcements from council members? Well, Marianne? I'd like to uh, thank uh, our village staff for the help with uh, our really great Earth Day event uh, last Sunday, uh, for Johnny's crew for putting up that uh, banner that uh, one of the Environmental Commission, Riley Dixon, designed, um, and Samantha Stewart for helping us go through all the hoops we had to go through and get the trash cans and everything. Um, and also Catherine Zimmerman, who's uh, on the Environmental Commission, and Bethany Gray, who's with the Habitat team. The two of them really put the, the thing together. I hope I didn't mi miss anyone, but it was a great event, and so I want to thank everyone who was involved. All right. Yeah, thanks, Marianne. I, um, I thought Earth Day was amazing. I appreciate all the support for uh, Celebrate Trails Day as well. Sure. Sorry that it was uh, not as uh, temperate as we would have liked. So I know normally we get a lot more folks, but it looked like you guys had a lot of fun. Um, I actually forgot to bring long pants, so I was in uh, northern Indiana doing my event and uh, freezing my butt off, but uh, it was also fun. Um, so I did want to mention a few things. Um, I guess, first of all, uh, yeah, I, I also, I know Riley uh, probably doesn't mind hearing again. I like his banner. He did a great job, and uh, Earth Day every day is uh, is really nice. Um, I also, uh, you know, we talked about, yeah, May's got a lot of things going on, but May is bike month. And um, I know one thing that's on the calendar is on May 17th is bike walk to school day in Yellow Springs. So uh, everybody, uh, you know, make sure to be extra careful if you're out and about uh, in a vehicle on May 17th. And I'm sure we're gonna have like our team there and we've got a lot of other folks that support that event. Um, we also, um, yeah, kind of a really cool thing that maybe some of you guys know about if you are on the Yellow Springs Community Foundation emails is um, there's a film festival that sounds like it's coming to town. And um, I'm really excited about the opportunities, uh, you know, and this is not just the little art, but there's talk about um, having some outdoor venues and some smaller venues. Um, I'm going to be curious when we get to the manager's report what we're thinking about with short street because I think there's some other like opportunities there, but that was one thing that was mentioned. Um, also may um, this is the first day of 
Asian uh, Pacific American Heritage Month. And um, this is something that's really important and significant to our village, um, highlighting our uh, goals around diversity. Um, I wanted to, you know, maybe I'll come back to this. Oh, Jalen Rowe's birthday is today. And so, you know, I want to give a shout out to Jalen Rowe. She's been uh, really great in supporting a lot of our activities around uh, village mediation and some of our more difficult meetings. Um, and uh, yeah, I guess also if folks aren't aware of uh, a world affair, um, a law ongoing Dayton International Festival, it's in Greene County now and it's happening this weekend, a uh, really great opportunity to enjoy uh, ethnic culture, food, uh, entertainment, whatnot. Um, but I guess I wanted to talk about like two uh, more specific things. So one was uh, the article week before last about event fees, because I think there was a lot of confusion uh, around that discussion, and we'll be talking about it again. Marianne, I really appreciated what you put in the packet, um, but I, I really want to like emphasize, and I said it several times at the meeting, but it still showed up in the YS News. We did not tell any organization that they had to pay these fees. We are talking about how to assess the costs for the village. And um, yeah, I thought it was unfortunate that that is the way like it came out because really we are trying to, you know, be physically responsible, trying to figure out what the costs are, trying to figure out how we all work together to continue to have a healthy, thriving community. But I mean, specifically, and I brought the paper with me, the comments about the village saying you had to pay X, Y, and Z, that never happened. That never will happen unless it's at council table. I mean, that's, we make those decisions. And, um, and ultimately what we're trying to figure out is how we continue to maintain the same things, understand what the costs are, and continue to have a balanced budget. But, um, but anyway, I, I do wanna correct Nobody has uh, ever said, you know, these are fees you have to pay, but we are trying to figure out how we balance that, you know, in the interests of the village overall. Um, the other thing I wanted to speak to is why we had a four hour meeting, <laughs> last meeting, and, um, and, and maybe we can reflect on this because I think we constantly, I know everyone at council table, uh, is thinking about like, where do we kind of get off the rails or whatever, but we had four topics uh, last meeting that um, I guess I'd like to emphasize that I'd, I'd really like us to figure out a way to vet these beforehand. So we had the YS Pride event, which we talked about uh, a lot. We had tried to talk about that offline. I'd still like to figure out how we work on events that way. We had the uh, home ink request, uh, which we'll be talking a little bit more about. Um, I had hoped that the housing committee like would be able to like figure that out beforehand, but I also understand, especially after talking to Gavin, that it's not always easy for a committee to you know make those recommendations. But you know, it ended up like creating a lot of like time. Um, we also uh, had uh, the issue around. Um, the vendor fees, um, which we had tried to talk about in finance committee, we had tried to work on. Um, it's a challenging topic. Clearly, there's some misinformation about like what's going on, but ultimately, that the goal there is to understand what the costs are and understand, you know, then how we make decisions about supporting those events, um, given that we're responsible for taxpayer dollars. Uh, and then we had the zoning. Uh, issue, um, which, you know, we're also going to be continuing to talk about. But I think in all those cases, one of the things that I think we committed to do, and this is where, you know, I'm talking to council primarily, is having these council committees or other ways to kind of vet these issues uh, before we bring them to the public meetings. Um, but I think we've got some other options as well. You know, we've talked about work sessions. Um, I know 
uh, Josue has made a recommendation that maybe we have a standard like 30 minute work session before every council meeting where we dig into an issue. Um, but uh, I don't want to have another four hour council meeting. Uh, and plus, we also had a, a, an hour executive session. Um, I don't think it's productive. We've been pretty good at like, you know, keeping our meetings to two and a half hours. But, um, you know, since I know we're always thinking about this, I just wanted to kind of highlight the things that I had seen from the last meeting and hoping that maybe that informs how we do those council committees and, and some of those other things. Okay, so that's a, a lot of announcements. Anything else before we move into the consent agenda? Yeah. Oh. I have an announcement from on the floor. I had suggested maybe they, they've got a quick one and they might not want to wait all the way to citizens' concerns. Okay. It's, I, I mean, if you're quick, it's all right. Do it now. Come on up. Yeah. If, you, if Judy made, laid, laid that out, go for it. Yeah. The crowd is on your side. No problem. Hi, my name is Izzy, and we're starting here to be part of these flyers tomorrow. Oh, really? Um, I am with Julia from Antioch, just down the street. Um, and as well known, uh, we often can be pretty surprising, <laughs> uh, but I promise I bring good news. Uh, so a while ago, uh, us students were sitting and talking, and uh, we're of the opinion that for everyone uh, in the world, honestly, these last few years have been pretty rough, um, to say the least, since the pandemic and everything. And we've really wanted to find a way to help everyone as a community, not just on our campus, but everyone oh, sorry. come back together just to do our part. Uh, so we had the idea of running a community festival to invite everyone who wants to come to just honestly come and have a good day. Um, so came to be the Antioch Victory Festival, which name derives from our motto, which is to win one for humanity. Um, and so I'm here to announce that we have been working very hard and we'll be hosting our festival, which is totally free to attend on Saturday, May 20th from 11 a.m. to 7 a.m. We have a lot of really cool activities lined up from a raptor show to visiting our farm um, and it will be inside the wellness center. We have booths available and activity space available as well for uh, community members who are interested. We're going to have food trucks and are working on having a restaurant off where the idea is uh, the restauranteurs are bringing samples uh, of their food for the community to, to try at no cost as a donation. Um, and you know, works for them, works for us. Everyone loves to eat. Um, but if you're interested in coming, please do. If you want a table or to run an activity. We'd love to have you. We're trying to reach out as much as we can. Um, we're going to have a website that will go fully live uh, by midnight tonight, which will have sign up sheets, and that's victoryfest.net. Um, but yeah, we're, we just want to invite everyone if you'd love to, if you'd like to do anything at the festival, just reach out and we'll get you set up. Thank you, Izzy. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. And um, we can also help promote that on our Village Facebook page. Um, so uh, are you connected? Thank you. That's cool. Uh, are you connected with Philip O'Rourke? Um, okay. Um, I am interested in okay. If you could send me that yeah, or as a PDF, then we'll get it. You can email me as well. Um, but yeah, we'll get that on our Facebook page and uh, exciting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, any other announcements? Okay, so we're going to move into the consent agenda, which are our minutes from the last meeting. Um, so I'll put that on and uh, can I get a motion to approve? Move. Again. 
Okay. So I think, Judy, we decided there was one change, which is um, when we talked about the YSDC piece, um, it had said the raise grant, which is one of the grants we're after, but there's also the rise grant um, without the egg. Um, so we are, uh, um, I'm making a motion to update that. And also I think we, we have Lisa Abel's name spelled correctly. Um, so I guess, uh, I guess, I guess I need to first of all ask for, uh, You actually gave me the corrections ahead. Okay. So we're good. So, so we can just vote. Yeah. Okay. So all those in favor. Yes. Marianne, something else. Uh -huh. Okay. Signify by saying aye. 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 All right. Any opposed? Okay. Uh, review of the agenda. Anything we need to add, uh, remove, or modify? Yes, I have two, okay. two things. Um, I would like to have some time under, I guess, new business, five or ten minutes, for us to discuss work sessions and start, uh, well, one, to ascertain whether council agrees to do that, and then start planning for that. And um, in the manager's report, and I've, I've spoken or I've emailed Josue, I'd like for there to be a discussion about the Fairfield. Eamon, what, how we might proceed about that. Yeah, that sounds good. And I may add to your work sessions thing. Um, I had kind of had a note about council committees based on what I was saying earlier. So those might kind of come together. Um, okay, anything else on the agenda? Okay. All right. So, uh, Judy, I guess uh, we're going to have Hi. you do petitions and communications. I'm set. All right. Uh, so there's a letter from Elaine and Keith Kresge of opposing the zoning code change, but actually sort of agreeing with it at the same time. Mm -hmm. They were hoping that one could simply create a duplex out of a single house. And that is, in fact, something that you would then be able to do. So, um, uh, so I think there's more openness to the idea there than they might have thought that there would be. Um, there was a card sent from Leslie Schaefer, which was extremely sweet. You should read it if you read the packet because she could not say enough good things about Denise Swinger and Johnny Burns saving her yard from becoming a lake instead of the pond that it normally is. Um, John Hempling set, sent an extensive letter detailing opinions on conditional uses, some which um, he uh, was more in agreement with, some that he thought were more helpful, some that he thought were less helpful. Um, that's fairly detailed. Uh, Marianne McQueen sent in a memo addressing multiple subjects. So she addressed several things that uh, went on in the last meeting, and that is also a pretty useful memo, uh, and it may get referenced under different topics this evening. And then Matt Raskus sent uh, a very kind uh, note appreciating staff's work with the neighbors from our neighbors group uh, in making zoning amendments. All right, thanks, Judy. Um, so this actually reminded me of what we got from uh, Chief Burge, which is on the table. Um, is this something we need to add to the agenda because it's urgent? It is a resolution. She, we, she just had not had time to crack the memo. Okay, so this. Okay, the... okay, so we've got this memo now. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Okay. Cool. All right. So then let's go ahead and move into uh, our very extensive uh, <laughs> legislative agenda. All right. And uh, we're going to begin with, um, okay, so actually, let me think about this. We have one second reading. Um, okay. So I'm not sure this is going to matter, but um, let me go ahead and do my usual, um, I like, to get a motion to uh, uh, read our uh, one ordinance for a second reading uh, by title only. So which, where are you? Um, that is 2023-18. You're not starting with the first thing. Well, we normally just, I normally just do it at the beginning of it all, so. The full reading is not required in the first reading. Second read, hence the motion on the second read. So we're not even going to talk about the first one? I'm not, I'm not clear so this is what we've done for three months now, like at the top, whenever we have a second read, I just ask that we can do it by title only. So moved. 
Second. Okay. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Okay. Well, we are going to talk about 2023-17, uh, first of all, and uh, we can do that by title only. All right. This is repealing and replacing Chapter 1242.04, Annexed Land of the Yellow Springs Zoning Code. Okay. Can I get a motion? No. Second. All right. Okay. So you may remember at our last meeting that uh, we modified uh, this to enter annex land uh, automatically as RC instead of RA. Um, we seem to get support from that, but because it was a substantial change, we started back on the first read. So, uh, Denise. Yeah, I, I don't have anything to add to that. Staff is fine with that. Okay, cool. All right. And we appreciate that. Um, yeah, I think, uh, as Denise said last time, it fits with our goals around uh, density. Um, so, um, questions or comments? Okay. Uh, all right. Let's go ahead and do a, a vote. All right. McQueen? Yes. DeVore Leonard? Yes. Brown? Yes. Housh? Yes. Thank you. Okay. And uh, next of all, we'll do 2023-18 by title only. This is repealing and replacing Chapter 1248, Residential Districts of the Yellow Springs Zoning Code. All right. Can I get a motion? So moved. Second. Okay. And this is part of why I paused because, um, you know, there, there are some thoughts on the table about whether we table this. Um, but uh, Denise, do you want to? Uh, yeah. Oh, uh, yeah, I don't know about that. So if you are planning on tabling that, I mean, uh, from staff's perspective, our position has not changed. Okay. Um, we still want to have it be conditional. And do you want to talk a little bit about that again? I would rather have Amy talk about that because okay. I feel like I talked about it too much <laughs> last time. All right. So Amy can kind of give you um, an understanding of conditional. Okay, great. And as Amy's coming up, I'll go ahead and just uh, open the public hearing uh, to make sure I cover that base. I apologize. I just put a piece of candy in my mouth from my May, <laughs> from my May basket. Um, yes, so we had a chance to discuss this at last meeting um, after the recommendation from the organization that raised all of these zoning uh, text amendments planning commission weighed the pros and cons of how to make that work and um, in the end settled upon multifamily being a conditional use in a single family district and that was the recommendation that's come upon you come up to you from planning commission staff of course supports that there's been a lot of discussion um, from johnny about infrastructure and the conditional use process how that plays into that um, and then also of course um, the discussion about how planning commission felt like it was a way to um, you know get the full review of every project through the conditional use process without it being um, simply permitted and then on staff's desk. So I'm happy to take any questions that you have or help you as you work through it. Well, I guess since you're up here, um, so I guess the two things on my mind are, um, you know, number one, um, whether the, you know, kind of institutionalizing the uh, uh, utility review um, covers the concerns. And so again, like, I don't know, that might be where Denise or Johnny might want to come back. So that's question number not one. Question number two is, um, and this probably is more for you, Amy, is can we put some of these things in our zoning code so that we don't need a conditional hearing? So playing through um, the hypothetical of this happening from beginning to end is, you know, a property owner owns a single family lot, they decide, or owns a lot in a single family, um, zoning district decides they want to put a two family, three multi family on it, then where do they go from there? We know um, council has a utility review coming in front of you. Actually, we're going to talk about it yet tonight. So there is a utility, mandatory utility review that's going to be added to the code. So, yes, those utilities will have an opportunity to be discussed at that point. Should you make it a permitted use, it could go right to that utilities review. My concern there is then what? Because there is going to be a conversation between staff and this property owner who wants to make the change. And if staff says, okay, this is, um, you know, permitted use, you're free to do this. However, it's going to cost whatever, $50,000, $100,000 worth of infrastructure improvements to get from point A to um, B. And the property owner says, well, I have a, you know, I don't know that that to be true, or I don't, or there's some kind of um, standstill at that point, right? We're, then, we're, then we have no resolution for that property owner. There's no meaningful way within the village for them to pursue um, you know, the next step of that. 
we have a conditional use process that happens in front of planning commission and then it becomes in front of council. And then of course there's an immediate appeal to common pleas court, um, which is conditional uses are very unique in that regard, conditional uses and variances in that they can be appealed in that way, which is a pretty quick streamlined um, approach for a property owner to resolve something with their community. So I see you value in a utility review that should be passed. I think that should be enacted into the code regardless. But the conditional use for this process is helpful because it allows for that for the whole picture to take shape before any um, project moves forward to know exactly how it's going to work on a particular lot, what it's going to mean for infrastructure, um, all you know, and what it would mean for wastewater and um, you know, there's been a lot of discussion about stormwater lately. So what stormwater concerns there could be, there'd be a way to mitigate and address those up front. Um, conditional use processes when done properly can operate as a mediation. It happens in front of planning commission, right? And there's um, the whole project can be viewed and all of the details can be worked out um, in a measurable, meaningful way. If there's a plat, a single family plat over the property that we're talking about, then there's a condition that the property owner, it's incumbent on them to deal with their HOA or neighborhood association or whatever the entity may look like, it might just be their neighbors um, that holds that legal right to say yes or no on that. So um, there's just a myriad of issues to be considered, could be, um, in these hypothetical circumstances and the conditional use lets that, lets that process play out. And you know, something, nothing is set in stone here. The text amendments can be made at any time. If this is, council moves forward in this way and it's made as a conditional use and in three years or five years time, it, well, you know, we think now it's we're, we're ready. Let's move it to permitted. Council could have that conversation at that time. There's nothing to stop you from initiating another text amendment in the future. Um, once we can see what the utilities review looks like, what multifamily or two family, whatever it may be in single family residential looks like, um, you know, the conversation doesn't have to stop there. It could happen again in the future. Do any of the other communities you work with have permitted uses for? No. Okay. No, as a matter of fact, um, the, the people who brought this to you um, showed me the first community I'd ever seen that had this, I think it was Fairborn, correct? Um, has duplexes as a permitted use in their single family district. That's the first, um, the first time I've ever seen them. All right. Uh, other questions for Amy? Okay, thank you. Um, all right, so other questions or comments from council at this point? Marianne? Yeah, um, well, I had a pretty extensive conversation with Denise and Johnny and Amy. And philosophically, I, I would like to see the time when these are permitted. I don't, practically, I don't think we're there. I think it would cause too many problems at this point. So I support ordinance as written. Okay. Johnny? All right. Take back on Amy for a minute, and then I just asked Denise a question, which actually just floored me. Um, so permitted, <clears throat> when you're talking about permitted, as I explained to Marianne, permitted means it's ready to go. And we're not ready to go anywhere except for one area, and it's one lot in Birch 3 that they could do whatever they wanted to. But <clears throat> we were talking about the utility review. I don't know where I'm going to find the time, but I'm going to find the time. But I can't have 50, 60, 70 people just come in and ask me to review things with no associated cost. This is, the majority of the work was done by Denise, getting all this stuff ready, and then she would come over and we'd talk, and we, I'd drive out. But if there's no fee associated with these utility reviews, I'm not going to have time to do them in a timely manner. I was shocked. I just got shocked that there was no fee for me to have dedicated time to be able to put the effort in to look at the storm, the sewer, the sanitary, and the water. That this is just. Yep. Add that to our agenda. Yeah. I mean, we totally need to have that. So. Could I say one thing because it involves a yep. conversation yes. we also had? Um, because I was, I asked Johnny about. The, there are three residence A districts, and I was asking him about the utilities in those districts. And I came away from that conversation feeling that uh, we have utility issues, whether it's sewage, water, stormwater, electric, 
that's it, I guess, isn't it? Um, in all of our districts, in in all of residents, say not not in every single lot or every single Correct. block, but every single district in the village. And so, well, if we might want, well, I might want to have these all permitted. We have a lot of work to do to get our utilities so that they're going to be able. Right, which we heard during uh, our goals planning. So, yep. Okay. Okay. All right. Thanks, Johnny. Um, any other council stuff before we? Okay. Um, citizen comments, Mitzi. Well, I've got to change pace here a little bit. Okay. Um, number one, um, uh, I want to thank council members for relooking at this and. Um, I'm going to read a statement um, and then um, change it up a little bit. Local zoning regulations allow communities to plan for the use of land transparently, addresses infrastructure plans and needs, and involves uh, residents and through public meetings. It's an important planning tool that benefits communities economically, socially, and improve, uh, improves health welfare and also helps conserve uh, helps with conserving um, our environment. While I personally appreciate the opportunity it's provided me as a property owner to address to address my concerns, questions, suggestions, and working together to find acceptable solutions with other parties, this has uh, been demonstrated in many ways. Um, I can remember a planning commission meeting where Home Inc. and residents on Xenia. Avenue um, met together and uh, brought up their concerns about water retention, drainage, uh, fire and safety, and parking issues. And through that meeting, there were re resolutions made. I hope council will think long and hard about um, the input and recognition uh, recommendations uh, from their planning commission um, members. Um, the zoning director, Denise Swinger, Johnny Burns' insight regarding infrastructure, um, impact and needs, and, and of course, the citizens of Yellow Springs history of being active participants in these processes. I suggest a town meeting be held, but it doesn't seem like that's gonna need to happen, um, and possibly even more surveys to get truly get input from residents. Uh, while I realize some council members have made it clear and advocate for alternative ordinance to um, make our allowance for more liberal development in RA areas, um, I really appreciate this being tabled at this time. Um, you know, we're we're a community of individuals and and members that like to be involved. And um, I appreciate that. And I thought and I feel that this would be silencing our community members when it comes to zoning and zoning reform. Thank you. Uh, John? <clears throat> Hi, I'm John Hempfling, Yale Springs resident. Um, so, uh, we're very speaking for um, me and um, Matt and Alex. We're we're very happy with uh, this improvement on um, the village's existing zoning code. Um, I spent some time looking over the planning commission minutes, uh, sort of reviewing uh, conditional uses of uh, residential uses in residential districts um, since 2000, which were just all ADUs basically, since there weren't any multifamily uh, applications um, in the medium density residential district uh, during that period. Um, but, uh, you know, they, they went through um, pretty pretty smoothly. Generally, the only um, condition that was, the only additional condition the Planning Commission would impose is privacy screening. Um, and, you know, that's not going to kill any any project. Um, and I, I imagine that would be pretty similar, I think, for uh, duplexes and probably townhouses in, um, in the uh, low density district after this is um, adopted. And um, I, I guess I wouldn't even necessarily expect that Planning Commission would uh, 
necessarily reject multifamily um, uh, applications either. Um, as I sort of said in, in what I wrote, um, my main concern would be that planning commission might um, sort of push the developer to build fewer units, but that's still certainly an improvement over, over um, where the code currently is. And I was sort of beating myself up that, you know, it, it hadn't occurred to me that rather than looking to sort of like buff up, you know, the permitted use process, the, the um, you know, site plan level B process to be where um, staff would feel comfortable with it, we could have gone at this and now it's too late, but you know, if we were coming at this again in the future, um, we could have come at this in terms of uh, maybe trying to um, loosen up some of the uh, standards um, involved with uh, conditional use reviews, specifically of residential uses and residential districts, um, specifically like that, you know, concerns about, uh, you know, traffic and noise, you know, that's just naturally going to happen with any residential use and that we, it would be, I would, I would hope that, you know, ideally the planning commission wouldn't uh, use concerns of traffic and noise to sort of push a developer to build fewer units. Um, but in any case, I'm, I'm very happy and I hope that all of you feel good about um, this and I hope that it passes tonight. Thank you all very much. Thanks, John. Okay, any other questions, comments? Okay, so I'll just say a few things, uh, but I think it's pretty clear where we're going. Um, utility review, critical, and we've heard about this forever. And um, yeah, we, I mean, I want something on the agenda to, to fund, you know, to attach a fee to that. I mean, yeah, we definitely, assuming Amy that we can do that, I would think we can. Um, Second thing that this discussion reminds me of is that I feel like we need to lock down our zoning code. Um, and so uh, I'm compelled by a lot of the things that um, the neighbors for more neighbors and other folks have brought up around that we should be able to spell out a lot of these things in our code. Um, I also think uh, I don't want another Ober or any other situations, the more that we can like indicate in our code what we want in terms of affordable housing and other kinds of things, I'd love to see that happen. And so uh, I guess that's a shout out to our planning commission. But I, I think um, I think we, you know, I, I definitely think there are things that we can do that would help to make conditional feel like less of an obstacle if it was spelled out. And so that was one of the things I took away. And the last thing is, I guess I do believe because, you know, the American Planning Association and like everybody else that's an expert in this area, like has highlighted that anything in the process is an obstacle. And I understand that, um, you know, Yellow Springs approaches it in a great way, but at the same time, like I was in that meeting with John where St. Mary's was talking about Yellow Springs nimbyism and uh, and the fact that you know basically developments come to Yellow Springs to die um, you know that's that's upsetting to me. On a lower level, it reminds me of when I found out that we were a dog unfriendly community, and we uh, you know we created a dog park, um, and so totally different things. But you know it shocks me to be in a meeting and hear that Yellow Springs is considered to be uh, NIMBY. I mean, that just doesn't make sense. So I believe that these are obstacles. Again, I think um, we do a great job. I think more clarity in our code makes sense. And I had some other notes here. Yeah, I mean, I, I think in general, um, we need to continue this conversation, but um, but I'm encouraged to hear John say that uh, you know we're on the right track, and I do agree for now with this resolution or with this uh, ordinance. I don't have a reason to not keep it conventional. So I mean that's where I'm at, you know, and I kind of put the task out there. I think Matt Raska wrote uh, a great letter to the editor um, around you know conditional versus permitted, but. I'll just say I'm open and I think, uh, you know, the single family housing thing is hugely problematic. And I'd obviously, I, I honestly agree 
everybody should have to come conditional. I mean, you know, Bates on even Mitzi, what you said, like, I'd love for every like project to have a discussion so that we can all like work on these things. Um, but I think we'll work on that and uh, I appreciate the conversation and I think I've said enough. Anything else? Okay. So then I think we're ready to close the public hearing and uh, take a vote, uh, Judy. All right, Brown. Yes. DeVore Leonard. <clears throat> yes. McQueen. Yes. Tausch. Yes. Thank you. Okay. All right, next up we have ordinance 20, 2329. Um, we can do that by title only. 202320. 20. Oh, 20. Sorry. This is repealing and replacing chapter 1250 business districts of the village of Yellow Spring Sonic Code. Okay. Can I get a motion? I move. Second. Okay. And I think, Denise, are you kind of talking about like there's yeah. several <clears throat> amendments that we're making here, right? Yes. This, this one in the business district is um, simply to make the uh, dwelling units on the upper floors where you have non residential below to be permitted rather than conditional. That's it. Cool. Um, all right. Any questions or comments? Okay. Um, yeah, I don't think we need to take a vote at this point. So I think that one looks good. Um, all right. So let's do uh, ordinance 2023-21 by title only. This is repealing and replacing chapter 1252 industrial districts with the village of Yellow Springs zoning code. Can I get a motion? I'll move. Second. Okay. Denise? Okay, so in, in the industrial district, we did not have a residential section. So we added a residential section, um, allowing dwelling units <clears throat> in buildings with non-residential uses. We're not um, saying whether it's upstairs or downstairs. Um, it will just be, because it's a conditional use, we can really look at if it's safe, where it's gonna be. You know, you don't want uh, an apartment and then have a toxic waste something below, you know? so. We just want to keep that conditional, and uh, zoning group also agreed with that. Okay. Questions or comments? Okay, looks good. All right, so then let's go ahead and do uh, ordinance 2023-22. This is repealing and replacing Chapter 1258 Schedule of District Uses of the Yellow Spring Zoning Code. Can I get a motion? So moved. Second. Right. And this uh, really is just um, taking all of these and combining them together, all the changes, which are all in the residential section. Uh, and it just is adding conditional, uh, adding dwelling units and buildings with non-residential uses in industrial. It's changing from commit from conditional to permitted dwelling units on the upper floors. And then it's adding in RA the conditionally permitted multi-family, single-family, detached, single, attached, single-family. Okay, and as a side note, just for folks still hanging in there, uh, you know, typically when we make any changes, we have to, you know, modify several ordinances to reflect that. So, uh, so they're all kind of in the same vein. All right. Questions or comments? Okay. Um, then let's go ahead and do 2023-23, uh, Judy. This is repealing and replacing section 1262.08E4, specific requirements of chapter 1262, conditional use requirements of the Yellow Spring Zoning Code. Okay. Can I get a motion? I move. Second. All right. And, and the, <clears throat> this is just housekeeping too. This is just adding the dwelling units and buildings with non-residential uses. Okay, uh, 2023 24, uh, we can do by title only. This is repealing and replacing chapter 1284.02, definitions A through B of the Yellow Springs Zoning Code. Any other motion? I move. Second. All right. So, although we have a lot of details, we try to have some detail in our code. Um, sometimes it still can be subjective, so that that's where the definitions play an important role. Because um, you can clearly explain what it is what try to get your message across through that definition and one of those um, that we wanted to add was aid to construction because we say it in lots of different places but we don't really have a definition of it so that is what we included in here that it's an, an amount of money that's paid to the municipality by the developer or property owner for for what required 
infrastructure improvements. Great. Okay. Marianne? Yeah, I have a question. Um, if uh, a, an infrastructure improvement is going to have a positive impact on more than one lot or development, whatever, how is that accounted for in the aid construction or is it? In other words, it, you know, does if if someone builds a lot, uh, let, let's say there's some empty lots. Someone builds on a lot. They need to have a, a bigger water pipe or something. They pay for that, and then that's going to benefit all of the other lots. Do they still have to pay for all of it, or how does that work? <laughs> You did such a good job last <laughs> <laughs> If it has to be increased due to the size of the development or the extra lot, the other people don't benefit from it because they're already receiving that. So the reason why it would have to be paid by aid to construction is, is the lot is needing more water, more sewer, or more electric. So it's only the only benefit will go to whomever is being charged state to construction no other lots or residents the neighbors would get better water lines or they would get newer water lines or larger they could do things later down the road but that's later down the road not right now yeah, so, can i just ask, is this common this site aid to construction Happened. And what what about an instance like what's the one of the seven colleges that we have that has the lots that got split up? You know, like there's multiple vacant lots East, that are East Center College. East Center College. So like on that one, if there's several, I don't know, if like we're talking about the home ink deal where there were, you know, where multiple units are going to get built, but you don't you're only doing one thing at a time. If somebody comes in there, I don't know what the infrastructure is there. We're, we're getting ready to, I'll give you a prime example. We're getting yeah. ready to put in electric, and we know that three houses are being built there. So we're going to trench in the electric, and the three houses will split that cost. But aren't there more than three lots? One lot doubled. So one person bought double lot, they're on building the double lot. Okay, thank you. All right, Johnny. Any other questions? Okay, um, and so then I think we lastly have uh, Ordinance 2023-25, which we can do by title only. All right, this is repealing and replacing Chapter 1284.09, Definitions T through U of the Yellow Springs Zoning Code. Can I get a motion? Move. Second. Okay, and I know that this is putting in the utilities review. Yes, and um, because it's a conditional use, I assume that the fee with the increase in our conditional use fee that that might help cover the utility review but um you still feel that way it's because it is a conditional use if it had been permitted it'd be That's more worrisome Right. Would see, and that was another worry with permitted that people would come and want all utilities review for something they may or may not ever do. So, what's um, the fee range now? I can't it's remember. It's now two hundred. Okay, so two hundred in general for a conditional use hearing. Yes. Okay. Well, we you know we don't have to decide tonight, but you guys think about that and decide if we need to. Yeah, we, it wouldn't be it yeah, wouldn't be hard to make it. It would end up being on another. It would be on the zoning fee schedule. We'd have to add it there. Okay. So it wouldn't. It would, we wouldn't want to put it into the definitions anyway. So I think the definition is good yep. and solid. It's just if you want to do a fee, then we would put it under the zoning fee schedule. Okay. Be a new service. Hmm? There'll be a new service. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, I'm, my guess is that you would get support to uh, make sure we're covering that. Um, yep. Okay. Questions or comments? Okay. Thanks, Denise. Okay. Um, so I know we ran through like several pieces of legislation, you know, again, like these are about trying to expand um, the abilities for uh, folks to uh, get their projects done. So I don't know if there are any citizen comments at this point, um, but remember these will all have second readings with public hearings at our next meeting and, uh, and 
there'll be an opportunity to speak then. Yeah, Denise. And her story will cover that next week. I, okay. I, I won't be here. I mean, I'll be on the law, but this is planned for a while, so I'm not going to be here on that for another two weeks. Okay. <laughs> but that's not that doesn't mean this is your last meeting right no okay. no, no, no 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 all right I, that's why i was like it means you get me next okay time. all right yeah that's it like, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> um okay okay so any other comments at this point um yeah i think these are all good things but there will be plenty of time to comment you know i just want to say some last uh thing I guess to you guys, um, you know, I heard that maybe there was a feeling that staff was being disrespected around the zoning issues. I mean, I, I just have to say, um, you know, probably that comes back to me. I am, you know, always open to hearing all the comments. Um, I hope you guys feel like uh, all of council listens to staff. I really think we do. And um, and then I also want to listen to new ideas and whatever. So I just want to make sure that um, you know we can think about it more as like having discussions that you know make things better for everybody. So sorry if you uh, if I created that, but uh, but again, you know my perspective is I want to absorb everything and then make the best decisions. So thank you guys. Okay, um, so I think then we're going to move into uh, our resolutions. And first of all, we've got uh, 2023 32, which we can do by title only. And this was amended slightly, that amended version was put on the table. Um, there was a slight change made to the title. And I, in fact, had the sewer relining date incorrectly uh, stated there. So that's been corrected. So the corrected title is approving a grant to Yellow Springs Home Inc. for funding for phase one, eight rental units of the Cascades Affordable Housing Project. Okay. Can I get a motion? I move. Second. Okay. Um, so I think this was laid out pretty well at the last meeting. I don't know, Josue, do you want to outline what the uh, sure, sure. sure. I, yeah. I, in uh, in alignment with the conversation that we had at the last council meeting and the memo that I submitted, that this uh, this resolution is before you. It honors that initial request of committing forty thousand dollars from the affordable housing fund for Home Inc. Uh, it comes in two form and two payments. One is uh, a a check payment right away of twenty one thousand nine hundred fifty nine dollars for that uh, sewer relining work that was done by the village. And then the second payment would be $18,041 that would be dispersed upon, upon successful award from the Ohio Finance Agency uh, for the project. The doing it this process, and as, as you, you may recall from the last council meeting, doing it in this, pro, in this method allows for homing to book the revenue on their end and also book the expense for the project. So they'll be able to do that uh, immediately upon our issuance of the $21,959 and when we do that second payment uh, when the grant's awarded. Okay. okay. All right. And of course, that's uh, coming from our uh, designated affordable housing fund, um, which I'm happy to see us using. So uh, questions or comments? Okay. Uh, any questions or comments from citizens? All right, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Uh, aye. aye. Any opposed? Okay. So then we'll move into uh, 2023, 24? 33. Oh yeah, you're right. Okay, 33. We can do that by title only as well. This is approving a TAP fee waiver to Yellow Springs Home Inc. for the Cascades Affordable Housing Project. Can I get a motion? No moved. Second. Okay. Um, you want to talk about this sure, one as well? Sure. Uh, this is uh, uh, providing uh, up to $50,000 of TAP fee waivers for the first phase of the project. Um, the only uh, item here to, to leap open is, is that we're not sure what the final TAP fees are going to be because there's engineering works that needs to be done. Johnny had connected with uh, our engineer and our one of our contract on that. Um, but we're hesitant to, to discussing those details because we need a wait from Home Inc. to uh, share engineering with us. So Johnny, I don't know if I miss anything from that. 
Uh, so that's what this covers up to $50,000 of tap fees for the first phase, which is eight rental units. Okay, Johnny, anything to add? Okay, uh, questions or comments? So that was one of the things, uh, the last thing the host way just said that, that I was thinking about with this resolution is that um, it probably makes sense to, um, uh, to amend it, to highlight that it is for those first eight units. And um, actually I talked to Emily, she gave us some language. Judy, do you have that handy or? Um, well, in the, you did not amend the title. You suggested amending it and that does change the resolution. Modify it to approve a TAP zoning and permit fee waivers for phase one, eight rental units of the Cascades Affordable Housing Project. Mm -hmm. So if we, you feel like if we adjust this to highlight the, the eight units, that that's a substantial change? Um, I think if you add zoning and permit fees, that is the substantial change because uh, I know that some of those permitting fees are not accumulated, that those don't come through the, the village. They're paid outside of okay. the village. Um, but if we focus on the eight units? That would not be substantial, no. Okay. All right. So I think I'm going to uh, uh, make that motion to, oh, Johnny? Yeah. When you say the eight units, I just want to clarify, <clears throat> if it's for the eight units, and they get their engineering done and they come back with a 12 inch like i suspect they're going to that tap fee for a 12 inch even though it's only going to feed the eight units because they're, they're building it for the 22 units that tap fee is actually two hundred sixty thousand four hundred forty five dollars just for the sewer so are we only giving them fifty thousand and then they've got to pay the other money how are we doing that because they're not going to put in just a six inch or they're not going to just put in a four inch for eight units they're going to want to build it for the 22. so are we just right which is what eye? i feel like you explained at the last meeting what's that i think i said i feel like you explained it at the last meeting correct but so if you're they're only built, waving they're... fifty thousand dollars then when they go to tap in do they tap into 12 inch which is Two hundred sixty thousand, because that's what they're going to have to that's what put in there. Because because that's, the, the, because that's the capacity. Correct. Okay. That's why I was saying that I needed the, because even if they do the minimum, let me just say this: even if they do the minimum and they got eight units with three quarter inch water line, they got one unit that's got to have a separate inch and a half water line on top of the three quarter for the ADU because they rent that as an ADU unit, and then eight units at the bare minimum of for. A, what they consider for a sewer line, you're talking $54,718. So therefore it still does not cover, the 50,000 still does not cover that amount. And that's just water and sewer. That's if they just did it for eight units. So, go ahead, Gavin. So, the way I understood where we landed the last meeting was that there was a little bit of art involved here that we had things we needed to figure out. Correct. And so I, th I mean, I'll just speak for myself to answer your question. I'm under the impression that we're waiting for more information to figure it out. Okay. That we were essentially saying, hey, we know we're going to commit something. Okay. And that we're going to have things we have to figure out for our budget. That we know that there are budgetary Im impacts and that none of this is expected to come this budget year, but next budget year. So I totally understand that you're saying, hey, what's going to happen with the rest of it? And I think the answer is right now, we don't know yet, but we were waiting to hear what else there's going to be that's going to figure out. Because for instance, let's say that they only need 50, let's, let, I think you could make an argument that if it costs $54,000 for the tap fees that would it would cost for four units, maybe there's a way from an accounting perspective, from a fundraising perspective, they can essentially segment out that chunk of the cost for this phase okay. and have another, I'm just, I don't know for sure, just the way that budgets tend to work, these kinds of things may be possible. 
So that's where I thought we left things was that we were checking to see if that was possible because they were saying that if they didn't get that kind of leeway now, that it w it could significantly impact the prospect of the project at all, just, just from a timely perspective. So that's all to say, I'm under the impression that we don't know the answer yet, but I think it's good that we continue to flag that it's not so not solved. I, I just wanted to make sure that everyone was aware that the language, I read the language too, and it says tap fee, and then it says don't exceed uh, $50,000. I just wanna make sure that we don't separate those two, that the max of the word that you're talking about right now for water and sewer is 50,000. Right, I think- Because we don't know until they have their engineering done. I don't, I mean, we could watch it again. I don't think, I think everybody up here was totally clear that it was not gonna cost 50,000. It was gonna cost a lot more than that. Okay. We were just recognizing that we were trying to get something that could make it not kill the deal right now. Okay. And I think related to that and what Carmen was getting at was that understanding that, you know, with an understanding that it's gonna be more units, we wanna, you know, do it the right way. Um, the reason why I brought up the, like, highlighting the first phase of the project is because there's an expectation of coming back for an additional ask. So I think it makes sense to clarify that um, okay. in, in this resolution. So, um, but yeah, but okay. we do not want you to like put in a substandard, you know, uh, right. set and then like, yeah, you know, something. change that out. Yeah, right. so I think that's the, thank you. Um, so I think I can make that a little clearer when I change section one around to TAD, the drop in your language uh, into the water and sewer fund to, to for phase one, eight rental units of the uh, home in Cascades project in an amount not to exceed. So that the in, in an amount not to exceed comes at the end. It's, we, we, we see that it's covering all of the preceding. And then I would, I guess, then drop it in again to section two, submit tap fee, tap fee requests for phase one of the Cascades project and then drop it up again in the title. Right. as we just did so okay. I can make all those changes and I I don't think they're substantive um, because it sounds to me like everyone understands we don't have all of the numbers but this is where council is sitting at this point right. in terms of the max and then my understanding is we're securing phase one funding right now okay okay um, all right so I think I made a motion to amend to you know again emphasize that this is for phase one the first eight units is there a second second okay um all right so let's vote on that first um all those in favor signify by saying aye aye, aye. any aye. opposed okay um yeah Gavin. sorry can i just ask a, a, a question to put on staff's radar just at, at some point so I, it, this is going to be an issue that will come up, it sounds like, in the future, right? How many tap fees of what cost, et cetera. So just there's no time, just at some point, I guess I'd be interested in how much money are we bringing in, like the volume of projects for, um, of like of revenue from tap fees and other related, like basically what I'm wondering is, is could we add like essentially an affordable developer, affordable housing development fee onto essentially a market rate developers um, costs. And I'm wondering what the, just like how many projects are there and what would it take to have that actually matter financially? Is that making sense? You're asking about impact fees. Sure, there, I don't know I what they're called. I think there'll be a, a discussion to have uh, how to structure that. Okay, mm -hmm. so if there's any information on that that could be provided, I would be interested. Mm -hmm. Really quickly, too, also, um, to be clear, and Johnny, please correct me if I'm not correct. Um, these are fees that are that don't get recouped. Is that right? So once once those are done, that's done, and we don't see, the village doesn't see any. Is that right? So once the... What, once the tap fees are paid, is that what you're asking? Right. It's a one-time fee, and what we're doing is we're covering the added costs that is on tape for the pipe, the plants, the chemicals, sure. and all that. That's what the one-time fee is. It's a capacity fee. Okay. Because we have to make sure that we have enough capacity. To never be seen or heard from again. Correct. Okay. Well, 
<laughs> I mean, I, th I mean, so I'm sorry that I, that I said it that way, but not really. <laughs> I don't think it was bad to right. say it that way. Yeah. Right. Right. <laughs> See, I mean, I think the laugh was just like, that's the hope, but yeah. maybe not the reality. Right. Yeah. Um, Definitely. Right. That sewer line is going to need maintenance. Right. <laughs> so. uh, Mitzi, come on up. Uh, Mitzi Miller, uh, resident of Yellow Springs. Um, I realize that you know we've given Omink thirty thousand last year, forty thousand this year, and we through the affordable fund. And um, with budget restraints, it's just amazing to me that now we're looking at um, waiver. Uh, issues and tap fee issues and um, this is just for one segment of this plan and they'll be asking again for more money and as a taxpayer you know I I I believe um, there's a real issue here and um, why one particular organization gets so much finance from our village Thank you. All right. Thanks, Mitzi. So, yeah. Is anyone else building affordable housing? All right. I mean, it's just that's it. That's Mitzi. That's the that's the dynamic. There's nobody else building affordable housing. There. I think council has said clearly in goals we want to see affordable housing. The only option I can see you smiling, Jose, and it's true, is that we have that we invest in loss in place. It's true. There are other people who provide other units that are arguably affordable in terms of actively acting as a developer for affordable housing. Is there anybody else? We other could. Than, other than us, no. Right. There are opportunities. We're, so just I mean, to say we're, that's- We're new to the game. We yeah. just started. I mean- Yeah, I just want to say that's all, that's what's going on awesome. is that we're trying to figure out how do we make this a, a more, how do we have more affordable units? This is the game in town. I understand. If they, we would love, yeah, they're we would love to, to hear come. more projects. Yeah. I know I would love to hear about more affordable housing, housing if, projects going on in the village. Was a fifth. If more affordable housing organizations want to come to Yellow Springs, we're definitely open to it. But so far, no one has been very interested, at least over the last several decades, except for the 80s when yeah. Ober tried to do it. And, well, I think we're we remain town, open, basically. and that was you know the loss in place example yeah. is a great you know experiment. Um, I, I don't want us to forget that there are other make the case aspects like the property and income tax that's brought into town. Um, you know the fact that like any kind of construction or activity brings revenue and tax revenue as well, um, and and again that we're you know building a community that can sustain our utilities and whatnot. Um, so this does remind me, um, Emily, that make the case document. Um, let's make sure through Judy that that's in the next packet just to like highlight that again, because we've been talking about this, I guess, for a couple months now. Um, and I'm sure if the paper doesn't have that already, they would want some of those uh, numbers as well. Um, so, but Mits, Mitzi, thanks for bringing that up. Um, but I, I think I think the important thing is, I think most of us agree we need more housing um, to sustain our community, and then we're very open to how we make that happen. Jessica, um, I am Jessica Thomas speaking as a private citizen. So I um, am in favor of council. Again, speaking as a private citizen, um, moving forward with helping Homing out. And I would just like to note that according to the auditor's website in 2022, Homing properties paid $113,789 in property taxes in 22 or 2022. Um, and of that, the village gets $14,716. So if the village were to just divert the property taxes from home and houses to affordable housing, like eventually they would pay for the donations and types of things that the village is giving to them. So I just want you all to really think about how investing in affordable housing is investing in our community. Um, there are some mis horrible misconceptions about people who live in home and housing um, and they do pay their fair share. 
Um, and I hope that Yellow Springs continues to support that despite some folks who don't want to. All right, thanks, Jessica. Uh, anything else? Okay, um, uh, Judy, let's go ahead and do a roll call on this. So you're voting on the amended? I thought we already voted on the amendment. So right. I'm okay. So, so yeah, uh, yeah. Resolution. So on the final resolution, yeah, yep. the amended. Yeah. Yep. Uh, Deborah Leonard. Yes. McQueen. Yes. Brown. Yes. Hausch. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Uh, resolution twenty twenty three thirty four. We can do by title only. <clears throat> this is approving a grant to Yellow Springs Pride in support of Pride Week activities. All right. Can I get a motion? So moved. Second. Okay. Um, all right, so we had a very robust conversation at the last meeting. Um, I think, uh, you know, maybe more than anything, I'm just going to reiterate that uh, what I kind of said at the top of the meeting, um, you know, we have tried to like kind of figure out what events cost the village for a variety of reasons. Um, one, because it's our responsibility to taxpayers. Too, because we have challenges around the budget, but at the same time, we understand how important events are to having a healthy, thriving community. Um, so, really, in looking at you know how we track these costs, uh, you know, one is to make sure we you know have an understanding of donations that we're making. Uh, that hasn't changed our practice from supporting great events like YS Pride or um, June, Juneteenth or um, MLK Junior Day or Street Fair or whatnot. Um, but at some point, maybe we'll keep it for the next meeting. I do want to talk about um, process was brought up at the last meeting. And um, I think the process is pretty simple. I mean, I, I guess if you're having an event, you have to get a permit. So that those permit instructions can highlight, you know, some of the things around uh, vendor fees and some of the other things that we've like brought forward. You still come to village council and ask for a donation to your event. And so my understanding is um, Street Fair hasn't done that yet, but I think we're going to have that happen at the next meeting. Um, so again, I think we should have like a process for all these events where we understand what the cost is. We get a request to support, and then that also helps the organization understand how the village is sponsoring that event. All right, so um, so I think in this case uh, we've kind of indicated for YS Pride that um, the cost to uh, manage that event from the village side are, are well above five five thousand, um, and so I think. That's where these funds are going to go. I don't know that we need to get granular about that. Um, and again, um, you know, I think just in terms of that, like request for a process, we can. I don't. I don't think it's that complicated, but I think we can get that together for folks in the future, so they just know, like, fill out your form, ask council if they can like support at what level, yeah. and then go from there. Mm -hmm. Did you want to? No, I was, just, I was going to reiterate part of your message about the process mm -hmm. that in the past years, when we have made such sizable contributions, we've had it here at the council meeting. Uh, but moving forward, we are looking at streamlining the process and have it be detailed as possible. Just last week, uh, and, and again this morning, connected with Paige about coming back to council with a draft ordinance. In fact, I was waiting during my manager's report, I was going to talk about the special events committee and I will request that we have a council member join that special events committee and a citizen so that we can have all the inputs as we bring forward an ordinance and all the, the procedural aspects of implementing special event protocol, special event planning, and associated fees and costs to that. So uh, we, we've certainly been talking about it for, for a while. We're trying to streamline the process, and I think we'll end up in a better place overall. Related to what's before you tonight, the fifty two the five thousand dollars for pride, I'll, I'll report back that I had a meeting with Amy Wansley, uh, Philip and Heather uh, to talk about the expected uh, cost. We provided an estimate to them over a week ago. They've accepted the estimate. So we worked out where the five thousand dollars is going to primarily cover our public works uh, expense or public safety expense to highlight what that public work expense looks like. Because we're closing South Walnut in uh, in uh, Short Street, 
on Saturday, there's church service on Sunday, and we don't want to get between you know folks and their worship day. We're going to have public works folks come in at the end of Saturday night to close. That's overtime. So just to hide, we don't need to get into the minutia, but uh, we've walked through those things, those items with pride, and we have an understanding that we're good to move forward uh, as the, the sponsorship has been pr uh, presented. Cool. And so we're going to use short street. We close the streets. Yes, we wow. we got a Walnut and Short Street. All right, I'm excited. Yes, Maria. Okay. Yeah. So it seems like there are at least three things. There's the cost that we incur on putting on an event. There's the fee schedule that you had developed, and then there's how how we determine our donations. So. So when you say you're going to come with an ordinance, is that ordinance going to have, is your thought that that ordinance is going to have all three of those pieces in it? And are you going to use exactly the information that we've already gotten? Or we you say a little more. Yes. So you, you, you highlighted three things. Um, the cost that goes into a service, the associated fees, and what council is willing to sponsor or forgive. That third item is really more of your discretion and your authority, what you're willing to, to cover for that. What we're going to commit, what we're committed to providing, expanding on the research that we provided, uh, outlining the procedural steps to securing a permit, planning for an event, what will be allowed, what were estimated costs for these activities are. So from us, you are gonna get a uh, better, better outlook on what those costs would be what the recovery fee would be. We're, we're approaching this as that there's no way of recovering 100% of our expenses. And we're not approaching it as looking to recover 100% of our expense, but we're all looking to recover some of it uh, because we understand the importance and the significance of many of these events are in, on our community. So you'll get those two things from us. On the third piece, that's when on what council is willing to um, sponsor or, or waive. That's really council's authority, and I think that's that's where you come in. Now we're we're I'm mean, I'm asking for a council member to participate in the process so that we have staff, community input, and council reflecting those views. Paige, did I miss anything? Okay. And I think the other way that we hit that third thing is through that process. That's going to hit, you know, that piece around how council is going to make a decision or whatever. Right. So I, I I think we can hit it, you know, in the ordinance, but. Again, I, I think it still needs to be the case like we've done in the past where, you know, if you are having a major event, you come, I mean, you put it in your permit form, but you ask council to support that. I mean, I think we've got to. And then when we give a grant, do we actually give money and then they pay us or do we just forget, forgive part of the cost? Yeah, so I think it, I think it's going to vary by, vary by event. So, uh, for example, in the past, we have paid for porta potties. That's an out. That's a that's the, the event organizers not incurring that expense, but we are. You know, examples have been Pride, Porch Fest, and, and so on. Uh, so there are going to be there are going to be times where that expense is a hard cash speakers, outdoor expense. We've done. Speakers, yeah. Mm -hmm. So I think it's going to vary by vary by event. In terms of how we book it on on our end, that's an accounting process that Amy will figure out how to how to allocate those those expenses. Carmen, did you have a question? Well, I was just var varying by event how we incur, like what how we determine what's a hard cost and what isn't. Var varying by event, I don't, I don't, I'm not really clear on that. Okay. Um, but then you sent out that Seattle thing, mm -hmm. huge town, whatever. Um, but it was pretty. It was a pretty good guide on about exactly how to do it, and of course, we're talking about on a huge scale. Yeah. But that's a good example. We could just take what we need from it and make it smaller because it's already there right right it's already it's all it's i mean it's it's really all there now we're talking about like live nation events and i Heart radio events and huge <laughs> concerts at big huge venues but all the information is there right if you want to have an event this is step one step two it's just laid out correct correct yeah. i also think what's nice about seattle is like okay it's a different town but they still like scaled it based on different sizes of events. And I think you mentioned at the last meeting that 
it was more data driven at least you know right. as opposed to some of the other right. um i will say carmen you know one of the things that we've seen in the past like when i think about um uh uh with kwanzaa i guess it was mm -hmm. you know they also like broke out like speaker fees and whatnot so we still have that form to use sure, yeah, right yeah. so i think it is a combination of what are some of these costs around just public safety that, abuse that, form, that form that form needs to be reworked yeah so well and actually i agree we should review it yeah but i think you know so we've got like kind of two we've got the public safety and public works piece and then we've also got like some of these hard asks around like can you support a speaker or whatnot um but i don't feel like the the process really needs to change that much i right. think the only difference is now we're sort of thinking about these other fees and then as a side note remember we kind of had a consensus around we were trying to shift mostly to in-kind mm -hmm. services mm -hmm. uh for events um so i think that's an important guideline that is yeah good Sorry, I was just going to follow up with what you say that important guideline as it relates to expenses and this is where the varies by events right because there's different groups that request different things and some are very straightforward others where there isn't as straightforward there leaves room for creativity or us having to figure things out this process is going to help streamline that so we there's less figuring it out gotcha. if you're closing a street it's going to take six barricades on each side or whatnot like that's going to be expelled and so we don't need to figure out how many folks we need to move that what do we need to equipment to move that actually later tonight we're talking about barriers so as a way to get better at these things so Gavin, go ahead so i think a comment from you earlier josue addressed this but um marianne in your memo you had raised this and it's come up here also i think brian you might kind of reference it in your comments so Mary, in your memo you talked about at the um, you know, at, during the budget process that we asked staff to provide um, information about the costs basically for these events and then said that we had got that at the last meeting. I'm just making sure I didn't miss anything, right? What we got at the last, fee, at the last meeting was a fee schedule, but we have we ever received information about what the actual costs are of events? Yeah, I'll need to, I need to review my notes to see what invoices we have. We, we do have them. I know Johnny prepared invoices, Paige prepared invoices in terms of what numbers are. I don't recall right now when we sent that over to you. We have them, but I will make sure that you get copies of what the team put together last year on what those costs are. I'll make sure you get the estimate what the team put together for this upcoming event. And so you, you will have that. Okay, and thank you. Now, one of the things that is referenced in this uh, resolution is that the funds are going to be dispersed upon receiving of the invoice so we're going to generate a invoice of actual cost how much time each personnel assigned to the project worked and whatnot so you're we're gonna we're gonna be booking that in our accounting system uh, more diligent moving forward and generating these invoices okay anything else okay so i i want to highlight three key points okay number one none of this is saying like everybody's got to pay like tens of thousands of dollars to have an event all right we are just trying to figure out what these events cost number one uh number two um it helps us then make decisions around donations how the village should be recognized it also like let's taxpayer know, uh, taxpayers know, like, you know, are, are we doing the right thing for the village? And then thirdly, I love that the committee is gonna involve a council member because, you know, I mentioned one of the reasons that we had 25 more minutes added to our meeting last time was we didn't vet the YS Pride event prior to the meeting. So we can't really do that here. So it's, I'm glad that a council member is gonna be part of that activity okay anything else okay so uh i i help oh, yes jessica J jessica i have a response i don't know if what your question is going to be but i i uh i meant to follow up to an email you sent earlier so i'll state it now okay do you, do you <laughs> mind? okay so so uh, jessica had asked earlier if what we were getting in return for the sponsorship the presenting sponsorship level and i just want to reiterate um, that the council is not going to receive 
a lot of the benefits that are listed in that sponsorship agreement. So for example, one of the benefits is 10 beer, 10 beer garden tickets. That those are things that we're not gonna grab and disperse out. So there are certain things of value in that sponsorship level that would not be appropriate for us to take possession of, such as the, the unlimited beer drinking or ten, ten <laughs> tickets. We're not gonna take that. So we'll take the recognition, but we're not taking the, the, the benefits that come with those cups. So actually, that was not my question. Okay. <laughs> um, I do have just two kind of brief questions. Um, first of all, it says that the money is coming from the boards and commissions fund. I was wondering how much money is in that fund right now. Mm -hmm. And then my second question, I think Gavin already asked it, but if you um, are already sharing with him the estimate of what Pride is going to cost the village, um, you said in your earlier comments, you already shared that with Amy Wamsley. Yep. Um, I'd be happy yep. to we'll, have that number also. We'll share that with you. Thank you. Okay. All right, anything else? Okay, so all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, uh, 2023-35, we can do by title only. Um, is this the yep. Okay, I'm going to recommend that we um, not, uh, review this legislation at this point because I know Carmen and Johanna have things that they still feel need to be worked out and in fact Johanna has come here to explain that. Johanna Schultz, Carmen, if you okay. like to have a brief explanation. So if um, I, I understand I would like to just move to table because um, I don't think that I want to be here for I'm I'm trying I'm sorry I'm, I'm trying to get out of here now. I we're gonna we're gonna get out of here at nine thirty. Okay. So don't worry about that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I think uh, I think that makes sense. Johanna, did you want to say something tonight? Or okay. Okay. Good. Okay. So motion to table. Is there a well, you second? Haven't, you haven't read it in. So huh? you don't, oh, you oh, got to read it. Oh yeah, yeah. Sorry about that. Sorry, Judy. Okay. Read it off to the next one. All right. So what do we do? We read it in by title only. No, you didn't. Okay. We didn't. All right. Let's do it. Well, no, you don't have to table oh. it this way. You can just move it to the next. All right, you're good with that? Okay. It's easier. All right, then let's do that. Okay, and then go to uh, 2023-36. All right. This is authorizing the village manager to enter into a contract with Digital Ally for in-car dash camera systems for the Yellow Springs Police Department. And I get a motion. I move. <laughs> okay. Uh, All right. That's way. Yeah. Thank you. As you know, uh, if you've had the pleasure of seeing any of our in dash cam posted on Facebook, you know we got a bit of outdated technology. Uh, so we're running against some challenges on our in dash uh, cameras. Uh, it's outdated technology. We also have a company software license and servers that need upgrades. That are the cost far exceeds uh, just purchasing a cloud base. Uh, in dash car system so uh, Paige is going to take it away there and it's in our budget so <laughs> Hey. Uh, all right, so as you guys know we acquired body worn cameras earlier this year from the same company. Um, so also, as you know, prior to budgeting this past year, we did an inventory of all of our capital assets, including our in-car camera systems, our dash cameras, as we referred to. Best of our recollection, because I couldn't find much documentation, they were purchased between 2010 and 2017. Um, some of them have a shelf life of as much as five years, but we're already seeing the wear and tear. We have numerous ones. Um, I know at least one car right now, it's not even actively working, which is, of course, uh, liability. It could also cause transparency issues and mistrust with the public. Somebody does a record request so oh, we don't have the video oh, it's just not working so um, also one of the features of the in-car cameras is that upon activating the lights it'll automatically sync with the body worn cameras which means officers don't have to activate their their in-car cameras and their body cameras it's all in one this is also uh, in a way a cost savings because if we do not move forward with the uh, upgrade to the in-car systems we have to upgrade the hard server the server that we currently have for our current systems which is as much in year one as it is in year one to upgrade the systems so high level summary there but i'm happy to answer any questions okay questions so yeah. the, this was in our budget right yeah. this is some, I, I feel like we talked about it during okay just making sure Anything else? All right. Thanks, Thanks Paige. 
Okay. Uh, any questions or comments from citizens? Okay. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. 2023-37. We can do that by title as well. Where'd you go? This is approving a preliminary plat plan for Home Inc. Cascades PUD. All right. Can I get a motion? I move. Again. All right, Denise. So um, I, the March 14th, was it March 14th? I guess it's been a while. <laughs> yeah, the uh, Planning Commission uh, met and um, made the recommendation uh, to council to approve a preliminary PUD for Home Inc. Now this property sandwiched between Marshall and Herman Street is already rezoned PUD. Um, last time they came to us was in 2019. So um, they're back. The, the project is scaled down. Uh, as you recall, may remember it was like a 54 unit, three story multi family building. Um, now it's, it's going to be 32 units that are built out in four phases. And the first phase, uh, as you were talking tonight, eight rental units. Uh, phase two will have six rental units, phase three, eight rental units, and phase four, 10 home ownership units. Um, so the uh, only variations that um, the Planning Commission made in their recommendation was to, uh, for a modification of the minimum parking requirements um, this is a senior housing project, so they would have been required to have 42. They're asking for 30, um, and Planning Commission was okay with that. Um, they, they also approved the density of 32 units on 1.8 acres. Um, the, uh, there was, I don't know if I need to go into, you've seen everything. There's a lot of little things in here that they also added, um, just about stormwater calculations and things like that will be needed for the final. Uh, plan review, but planning commission is making the re recommendation to council to approve this preliminary PUD. All right. Thanks, Denise. Mm -hmm. uh, questions or comments? Okay. Well, I would think uh, this has been on our, our radar for a while, so uh, <laughs> I'm hoping that we are going to move it forward. Um, okay. So I think all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Last piece of legislation, 2023-38. I told you, Emily. Did I not tell you? Wow. <laughs> yeah. You were here to state your case, huh? Just up here. <clears throat> well, thanks for being here, Emily. Yes. This is authorizing the village manager to act as a fiscal agent for a grant received from the state homeland security program. All right, can I get a motion? I'll move. Second. Okay. Uh, we'll attack. We'll tag team this Paige? with uh, yeah. with Paige. Uh, as you know, we have a great relationship with uh, emergency management uh, agency at the the county level. Ethan has been working with uh, Paige about finding resources not just for us but that benefit the entire community and. We're jumping on this opportunity that will be 100% reimbursable in the states. Yeah, I don't know what else. That's the best point right there. 100% reimbursable. I love that so, point. Yeah. Um, free stuff that keeps us safe, right? So uh, this mm -hmm. is actually, I, I put in the bottom of my memo, I should have put it at the top. Just want to highlight again cost savings to the village long term. Uh, Johnny and I have already had many discussions about. Uh, additional needs for event planning, including the purchase of potentially more concrete barriers. I don't know if many of you know, but we did have a couple incidents at last year's street fair that were uh, hair raising, to say the least. Um, and these barriers are, are, are a little bit of a response to that as well. So any questions about what we're trying to acquire? Hopefully I highlighted it. So oh, sure. do we, oh, so you, we've been using cement barriers mm -hmm. and what you're looking at is something that's Portable. So. Yeah, it's a portable. Um, so the, the best example, and I, I don't want to commit to necessarily this specific brand, but the mm -hmm. best example is uh, Meridian is uh, the, the brand name of this particular barrier. And they stop uh, up to a 3,500 pound vehicle on a dime. Um, uh, yeah, very, very secure barriers that can be moved by one person. So it's pretty impressive technology if you want to go to their website. I'm also happy oh. to send a link of some of the videos that they have available if you're interested in that kind of watching crashes and such. Well, does it get like a 
attached into the it doesn't no mm -mm. it's on wheels the way it, it transport it has a single lever that you put in and and wheel it in put it right in place so i know should ask more than ninety thousand dollars or something like that <laughs> and i'm not finding it what was the uh so there were the you know 19 or so barricades and what was the other thing oh something to move them yeah, on is that a because trailer? because trailer. they are there's so many of them and for them to be quickly deployed okay. a trailer yeah gotcha. a trailer to haul them okay. around in so all right cool all right uh looks like mitzi's got a question thanks Pete. they show sure. any of that like the pride of that mm -hmm. and your closing streets that those would be used yes ma'am yeah anything we can keep the public safe including johnny's guys while he's out working on the streets and stuff so and so just for folks that didn't hear, Mitzi just asked, uh, can these be used for any sort of events? And it sounds like they can be easily deployed. So, Absolutely. all right, thanks. Thank you. And 100% reimbursable. <laughs> okay, uh, any other questions or comments? Okay, uh, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, we are now into citizen concerns. This is the point on the agenda where we welcome any comments up to three minutes for any item that's not on the agenda. So do we have any citizen concerns? Okay. Oh, Jessica, oh. come on up. Uh, Jessica Thomas, um, I guess this is a news related question. Um, just two things that have previously been on agendas um, that said that you said we are going to relook at but haven't happened so far this year the first is the utility roundup program um, there were some really really good recommendations from elise burns um, when that policy was looked at again last year um, some of most of the things were adopted but some were not i was just in it at during that conversation you said you were going to look at them within the next year or so and i wondered if that time could be now when people aren't when you like i'm sorry trying to think of how to say this um during the time of year where if a utility gets if electric specifically gets shut off it might not mean somebody sitting in their house cold um i'm hoping that we can be proactive about possibly having any of these changes and the second one was looking at um the stormwater fees that were enacted um and, and uh, during that conversation um there was the potential of eventually doing some stormwater mitigation um not fees but like i guess credits for citizens who are trying to mitigate stormwater coming off of their property already and i was wondering if council had any intent of looking at that again anytime soon okay Thank cool. you. Yeah, I think utility roundup. Let's have an update in your report next. We're, we've, we've been talking about utility roundup as a utility roundup 2.0 thermostats, dedicated revenue from sell of rec. So it's going to come up as part of our uh, sell of rec policy and proposal. Okay. Uh, so that's been in the works for some time. So we'll, we'll have that. I think we that comes back May 15th. Okay. Cool. Um, so we'll we'll have the conversation right around that. And well, then stormwater things. Um, well, let's have like let's have in your next manager's report just kind of like what the vision is now that we've you know got that um you know for storm fund model. in place yeah. yeah and then um but i think it is interesting that jessica specifically focused on um you know is there a way to like balance that out with people that are mitigating their storm water contributions so um so yeah so let's put that yep. in the next questions okay any other citizen concerns all right we do not have any special reports so i think that moves us to the manager's report and remember marianne wants to highlight fairfield pike which i know carmen and i do as well and probably gavin yes uh well uh, i think i had a conversation with with you guys about providing uh things that are happening down the pipeline among those is the gas aggregation so you're seeing this more full out uh, report so that when we're bringing things to you sort of uh, are caught up to where we are on things uh, so I've got that I've got staffing updates health insurance the agraria projects I think the agraria projects are going to require some significant time down the road for us uh, so I've got that information included in there 
if you see something that you have a question now, please let me know. You can always email me and say if you want to check in about these projects. So I've got that. So do you have any questions on the manager's report before we transition to Fairfield Pike and Special Events Committee? Any questions on the report? Okay. All right. So then let's start with uh, Fairfield Pike. Uh, Paige left. <laughs> um, <laughs> she snuck out. <laughs> she snuck out right on, on this piece. Um, I think uh, I'll start off with saying that I that Jason's uh, email highlights that we've seen some of the intervention. There was a couple of weeks where we had mayor's court filled with speeders. So we had we certainly increased our our intervention efforts to catch more speeders. Uh, obviously, there's a behavior change that needs to happen. Mm -hmm. The ways to get into that behavior change, we looked at stop signs. Uh, Green County engineered uh, adv strongly advised against the stop sign, the four-way stop, because it will create greater liability for us. They've been proven to not slow down the traffic in those kinds of areas that instead they create more crashes. Uh, so we're advising uh, against putting a stop sign. So we're back to some uh, boots on the ground, ticketing people. We've had some successes, but the minute that the police officers are not there, well, guess what happens? Speeding picks up or uh, folks resume. So uh, I know, Carmen, you had emailed about setting up a meeting page. Uh, the Marianne, you had uh, requested additional information. We're going to be back at this to tr try to tackle other, uh, implement other efforts to get at that behavior. Well, um, I also sent that uh, email to the action. Okay. I mean, it, it's unacceptable that we have a dangerous street. Mm -hmm. And it's dangerous because people don't obey the speed limit. I mean, it's also dangerous because it's sort of narrow, no berm, no sidewalk. But we can't just have a police officer standing, you know, or there. Not, there must be something that we can do. That. Well, I mean, so one of the things that I'll say is this. So optics, we have officers posted on different sides of town. Sometimes they're hang, like there'll be officers, two of them at Speedway, whatever. So we have, and, and like this is about optics. If you have somebody like on 68, there was always an officer in the last couple of years. Every, you know, people know this, um, either at YSI or at the Dollar General posted up. People stopped speeding. It became known as a speed trap traffic has slowed down significantly there so having an officer on patrol on fairfield pike more often than just an hour a day will will deter that behavior i think and no you know we can't do the stop sign thing maybe an overhead red flashing light or something because i live in the i live off i have to to get into my plat i have to go on i get off of fair acres so fair acres and fairfield, fairfield pike it's I've gotten I've almost gotten hit coming out of the plat and it's, it's because people are speeding and they think that it's a rural route and around here you can go 55 or 50 on rural routes and it's not it's residential. Um, but if it becomes known as a speed trap that's going to change behavior. Yeah. If you start getting you know if people start getting ticketed and they have to pay every time. If they have to show up in mayor's, mayor's court if they're inconvenienced that's what and my, that's what changes behavior because otherwise like those flashing signs that says like you know 25 just saying and it's like oh yeah it's cute just saying but yeah. that's just that's a sign telling you to slow down it's not an officer handing you a ticket right and i'm not particularly pro like ticketing people but it's gotten to the point where you know animals pets have been killed children have you know it's been there have been near misses and it's and because it's on that side it's on my side of town i see it happening like every every single day yeah on the topic you said tickets work yes they do work um a couple months ago we had looked at a change of law and amy i don't know if you want to weigh in on this we had looked at creating a speed trap and the law has changed around our ability to put uh unstaffed uh speed traps so the speed cameras um, we looked at it, there were some issues, we could do it, um, but it would mean we would lose some local government funds, 
dollar for dollar. What do you mean? Yeah. Like having to have an whatever officer, we collect. To ha wait to ha wait to have an officer there like a couple hours a day and then no it's like, whatever we collect for those. We can't do those. cameras though. No, we can. We can. We can. But we just can whatever now. we collect, we have to deduct from our local government yeah. allocation, which we actually may end up doing better <laughs> oh, uh, with the, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um but yeah that was that was one thing i think it is probably you know maybe amy do you want to come up and just like brief us on like what what we can and can't do so i my understanding is if we have a speed camera we have to have an officer there to validate it mm -hmm. or I no the law has changed on that Okay. So there, you don't have to have an officer present. There's um, nuances in the law that I can't speak to off the top of my head about how you have to file. Used to be you could handle a citation like that internally. Now I believe everything has to be filed in municipal court. So there are court costs involved in moving forward with it. It's not as um, easy and inexpensive as it once was. So you'd need to contract with a company that sells the red light cameras or they're always referred to as red light cameras, but they are speed cameras. Of of course as well so you need speed cameras um you can mount they can be mounted on intersections or there's mobile ones um and then we'd have to give consideration to all the nuances of what you'd have what that would mean and one of the big things is the local government funding anything you have to there's um quarterly or maybe twice a year reports that have to be filed with the state of ohio and then whatever you've collected based on those cameras is going to get deducted from the local government funding that's um, given to the village but i can put a memo together on it of what the steps you'd have to take to move in that direction Okay. Um, and then what you would have to do to stand at the program. So, oh, but like, but versus like having an officer there, like, yeah, like in the morning and in the afternoon when people are like speeding, like at between like seven and nine, done. It's ridiculous. Between four and six, it's ridiculous. And that would be probably, I mean, I don't know, maybe that would be less expensive than getting speed cameras and doing all that technology stuff. That's just my opinion. I don't know. And if you want the cite, if if um, you'd like the citations to be filed in mayor's court, doing it with an officer is the best way to do that. Yeah. I I view having an officer there as a temporary. I think there are some things, whether it's uh, extending the or, um, bump out. Yeah, traffic calming. Or yep. other things, but I'm hopeful that Chris Bongiorno might be able to help us think. I mean, yeah, that's why I thought back to transportation. Yeah, I'm glad you're making that recommendation. I had a note on that too. Um, I do think Fairfield Pike is already very narrow, so I, I, I mean, traffic calming. I'm wondering, but you know, I think that I think that think. for the person that wrote the letter, you know, like it's having an officer there, making the officer available during those hours is gonna maybe stop someone's cat from getting hit, and I think that yes, it needs to go to active transportation. I don't have any dis I don't disagree about that at all. But in the interim, you know, there are people the people are losing their <laughs> animals and people are having like near miss car accidents. I will, I'll definitely assign more officers um, to that to that post for more more speed speeding um, and and why is and why can't we have a stop sign there? The, the the recommendation from the county engineer Stephanie Golf was that because it th that that type of intervention doesn't specifically address high speed routes, it would not incentivize people slowing down. They would actually in be incentivized to run the light. That could result in more accidents. There's a longer story there, which is that you'd have to get township cooperation to get the right. signage started yeah. out in the township to get it awareness and slowed traffic on the way in so that's the bigger story so maybe that's part of what we need to do is work with the township because the signage is an issue I think. Yeah. We, we did we did upgrade the signs and some signs are going to be replaced by stephanie goff if they haven't already been replaced and that is uh indicating that the speed slows down into the the, the corporate limit so that sign was put up and uh, so we have updated signs and there was more work that Stephanie was going to do. So I'll check where that status of that work is, but we did put up the reduce speed ahead sign so that people have a cue to slow down ahead versus that sign was faded or didn't exist. So let me get a ticket. Okay. So we should talk to the township. I guess I'm not convinced that we shouldn't have a stop sign there, but you know, 
I, I, I mean, I respect Stephanie. I think she's, you know, very knowledgeable. But I have always wanted to look into the speed camera thing because I actually believe that if we set up a couple um, where people come into town, we probably, uh-oh, that's why she came in to like nail me on this. I thought I was going to get away with it. Um, but I was just talking about, I mean, and I mentioned this at Active Transportation, one of the meetings, which is I, my sense, and I'm not always, we're never sure, is that we would probably co collect enough funds to help with traffic calming initiatives and also build capacity. Um, so yes, definitely, Amy, a follow up on that so that we can start to talk about that makes sense to me. But I think, uh, you know, if, if regularly, if people knew that, you know, you're going to go through that radar camera, it's going to make a difference. So, um, okay. Well, this is good. So we're going to do something. Yeah. So or we're going to do more, more beats. And um, I, Paige, I don't know if you want to talk about your numbers. I just pulled it up as Brian was speaking. Where just uh, details on the traffic infractions, traffic stops that we had just in that intersection or on Fairfield Pike. We're looking at 130 total traffic stops. No, uh, 130 details. So details. Oh, anytime we. Um, so as you guys know, I'm, I'm very data. I'm very data driven. So the way we started taking in these complaints were, you know, if I received one, two complaints in the same area, I would request for our citizen um, Joe, who has the speed trailer, which is actually owned by Joe, not owned by the village. And Joe will set that trailer up for us in, in periodic troublesome spots in the village. So I get a couple complaints. I ask Joe to set that up. We'll leave that there for between four and six weeks. Once that's done, we pull the data off of that, and that'll actually give me about a 60 page breakdown of how many cars are coming through there, how many are leaving there, what the oh. highest speed is, lowest speed is. It'll give me the days of the week, the times of the day. And so I'm able to actually narrow it down to the, the days where the offenses are happening the most, the times <laughs> of the day where it's happening the most, and then assign officers to details on those time frames. So we've done rotating six week details over the last year and a half. Um, of total, we've done 130, and those can range between 20 minutes all the way up to an hour, depending on how long the officer has available. Because as you guys know, there's oftentimes officers are by themselves, so they will sit out there unless they get pulled away. Uh, during those 130 details, they have made a total of 69 traffic stops. So um, we have obviously been trying to put the work in to uh, respond to the citizens and their and their concerns so but as with any behavior um when you know mom and dad are away the mice will play so we leave and the behavior reoccurs how much uh for a ticket for one of those stops it depends on average uh, uh so 150 150 mm -hmm. okay we had a few folks speeding over 20 we had 125 what's that citation uh that's going to be 250. So, so we, we should look into this because if you do the math, I mean, to let's just say it was like 100, I mean, we get about 140,000 from the local government fund? Yeah, about that much. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So, I don't know. It might make sense, but we should talk about it. So, we're talking about the red light cameras that another oh, law allows us right. to do red light cameras, red light speeding cameras, cameras gotcha. speeding cameras. So, if we had maybe like three at the mm. main entrances, mm and we could not have to deal with capacity and <laughs> we'd probably collect more than we do get from the local government fund would be my guess yeah. that we could like invest in traffic calming is, so is, is that something could do we so, can, so we i can, thought you meant that they would subtract what we receive from our local government yes fund. right they'll be offset we, but i i wouldn't think that the red light cameras issuing the tickets and following through with anything so you're still talking about a lot of back end work correct oh i can't speak to that i'm sorry i don't yeah. i don't know Earlier. it's pretty automatic it's not yeah, yeah. Uh, we'll look at it later. Yeah. All right, thank well, you. Well, the other thing, uh, Amy, are we able to increase our speeding fees? That I don't know. <clears throat> I think we're. <laughs> <laughs> well, they, That's kind of my ticket driver. Did he set up this work? 
You know, because I, you know, a hundred dollars. Let's go. You guys know I'm, I, I grew up in DC, and DC is well known for its uh, effective use of red light cameras, P cameras, and no turn on red cameras. And the tickets aren't a hundred dollars; they start at two fifty is the lowest, and it goes as high as a thousand dollars. I think I paid one hundred and fifty on the line. <laughs> uh oh. <laughs> See. But it was effective. Well, so when are you going to start? Uh, we need to have a like a, a meeting, a subcommittee meet, and then we can bring back. Some so we need thoughts. to have a sub. So we, we need to have a subcommittee meeting. So the people that live on Fairfield Pike right now, who are worried about their animals getting hit, we're having a subcommittee meeting before we talk about maybe more officer detail or host way. You said. no, no, I committed to that. that yeah. We're going to get that. Okay. We're, we're just trying to figure out if we can do some longer term. Mm -hmm. yeah. So yeah, I think the committee is talking about the red light cameras and yep. looking into that and cost benefits. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Good. Anything else on the manager's report? We talked about the special events committee. Oh yeah. Do I have a volunteer? Well, if no one else, I'll do it. Okay. So. Okay. All right. <laughs> yeah, Carmen and I'll tag team. Okay. That sounds All right. good. All right. All right. Cool. Uh, yeah, and if we can both make it. There was there cool. another request for the manager's report. I think that was see. it. Yep, some new no. business. New business, uh, film festival. So on the film oh. festival, you brought that up. Uh, yeah. The film festival, uh, and then there's the work session piece. On the film festival, I did attend a meeting with the uh, with the chamber of commerce. I offered the John Bryan Center as another site to play a movie. Um, I will schedule a meeting with Eric, who is the person leading that effort. And we'll see what else is needed from the village. I indicated our support at the last meeting we had on this. I think it's it's a great idea. We have filmmakers here and all kinds of very creative people. Yeah. I, I was invited to a screening at the uh, Little Art Theater for jury duty, and I'm stuck on that jury duty uh, <laughs> <laughs> episode. Carmen was there, oh, uh, nice. and I have I have jury duty tomorrow. <laughs> so, oh, in real life? All right. Yes, in real life. I was supposed to go today, and I called and they said oh you show up tomorrow at 8 30 so i gotta right. be there tomorrow your civic duty so uh so yeah so I'll, I'll keep you abreast of that film festival i think it's good activity we'll figure out the the, the details of it yeah so again they're targeting october and i'm really happy that we're thinking about short street now because that was one of the venues that they mentioned to do some like an outdoor screen so, yeah that didn't come up, but I'll, I'll, I'll discuss yeah. it with Eric, see where it goes. Yeah, I mean, they didn't finalize that, but they mentioned like potential venues. I think an so. outdoor screen time makes sense. Yeah. Where is the right location for it? Right. Yeah. Certainly. Um, good, good, good. Um, okay. Anything else on the manager's report? Okay. All right. Thank you. I think I will just mention, because it's kind of in this context. Yeah. Uh, so I had a great meeting with Gina Marie um, from a community foundation. and. Not only did she mention uh, the film festival and opportunities there, as well as, uh, and I think Gavin knows about this, like potential for potentially a big donor to support the guaranteed income. Um, but a third thing that she highlighted, um, and she's been talking with Osue, I guess mm -hmm. the Community Foundation is, they're interested in the, uh, the former school administration building. And I just want to say I love that idea and the idea that it could also be a venue for nonprofits. You know, they've thought about how that space could be allocated. Um, they would work with us. We've talked about that could be another place for public restrooms. I love the idea of like using Short Street sometimes for events. You know, we don't have to close it off all the time, but especially in the summer. So, anyway, I know you're already thinking about this, but I, you know, when we had that conversation, I thought a lot, saw a lot of opportunity. Right, we've been talking about it for some time and we needed to make formal, formal discussions on it. And it sounds like you're ready to move forward in that direction. So certainly I'll, uh, I can look to finalize that agreement with her, with uh, the community foundation and bring back a lease. In a nutshell, if, if we're already talking about it, well, I, I would prefer to speak with Jenna Marie to finalize some of the detail, but. Uh, it would open up some more retail opportunities in the village if with this transition that happens on cost wise, I think, uh, you know, we will definitely make a lot more money than the past arrangement of uh, $1 a year. Uh, so I think uh, I think it could create both a revenue stream to support what is a historic building and, and the history and legacy of that building um, while also providing great service to a community. 
So. Yeah, and I'm glad you mentioned because Gina Marie emphasized that point of opening up their current space, which is right on Dayton Street, which would be great for retail. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Anything okay. else? I, I have yeah. one more thing. Yeah. Uh, tomorrow's a special day. Other than I have jury do well, no, that's not so special. But it's uh, it's Denise's birthday tomorrow. Wow. Uh, <laughs> so so Brian. I uh oh! Okay, all right, all right, all right. So I think you'll get uh, your area of fun. <laughs> you want to? We should sing Happy Birthday. We should. That all right. Oh, happy, birthday happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Denise. Happy birthday to you. And many more. <laughs> all right. <laughs> I was going to say, why don't you just wait till midnight? Oh, <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. Well, well Brian rushed us through it. <laughs> Nine o'clock, we're almost done. See? All right. So, and it looks like Denise is ready for new business. Okay. So, as you know, um, last December, we uh, finalized the PUD that had been sitting there for several, since 2018 at Millworks. Um, and uh, staff had talked about this with some neighbors probably four or five years ago in the comprehensive land use plan in 2010 and also in 2020. It suggests if you're going to expand at all the, the central business district, you'd only expand, expand it to the north up to Millworks. And so when we did that, we looked at, well, what would that require? <clears throat> Um, we would have to rezone a couple of um, residential homes along Railroad Street, and um, it just got to the point where, well, staff finally thought, well, you know, what we could do is just with a PUD, we can have the, the existing underlying zoning of I-1, but also add in a, a business district zoning as well. So that's what we did for Millworks. Um, what we want to do now is just tonight ask you, um, because in the PUD process, there is a requirement of size, five acres or more. We don't want it to be rejected based on that. So we're asking for you to allow us to move the process forward. So this isn't a vote to say yes or no on the PUD itself yet, because it has to go through planning commission and then back to you. This is just giving us the ability to explore it further. And so it's um, three parcels with there's two three ownerships? parcels two three. yeah actually um the bushes are here tonight they have two parcels bush co and then the other will be massey's creek ventures which brian it wasn't able to be here tonight but he did say that um if and the community wants an update that they're hoping to be open by april may they're going to start here this summer on the internal construction of the lumber market eatery <clears throat> so that's moving along and they're hoping within nine months they'll be open so i'm just asking for your consideration to let us move forward with this and hopefully solve one of the issues that keeps coming up in the comp plans sounds good to me all right everybody's good okay sweet so if okay. you would take a motion that would be great oh you want a motion all right so a motion to support uh moving forward on exploring uh the pud Okay. So you're moving to approve a PUD on less than five acres. Five acres. Oh, are we doing that right now? It's okay. Just to, yeah. it's, it's to move forward on letting us explore it. it. Explore it. Exploring it, right? But okay. Are yeah. we doing a spe the specific so site? Move to consider or just in. Okay. It's just, yeah, that's good. I'm just asking for okay to explore, explore it. Yeah. At this yeah. site. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yes. Okay, and I think that's what I said. Three, so you had a yeah, second. Three parcels. Yeah. Okay. This one, this one, and lumber company. Okay. And even if you combine them all, they don't equal five acres. So. Right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so all those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Okay. All right. And then we were going to talk about work sessions, Josue. Yes, I, I've uh, spoken with several of you about the work sessions. I think a lot of the challenges, and I think we can. Last last council meeting there. Are Few agenda items that we didn't vet through. I think having a standing 
30 minute work session every council meeting it gives us the flexibility to talk about specific issues and specific agenda items that are coming up. I think there are times when I as the manager am looking for feedback on a particular things that we get to managers report and you know it's it's nine o'clock and gosh we had a long day you have full time jobs and so we 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 rush through the that last part of that meeting. So I think a work session at the beginning of that council meeting gives us the opportunity to have a deeper dive about a topic or a future agenda item. And we can we can coordinate a little better and reduce some of the anxiety and miscommunication uh, on issues that happen in council meetings. And the beauty about the work session is, you know, we can, because we're not taking action on things, we can discuss more freely particular topics. So then, Judy or Amy, if we do this, is that, does it happen at seven? Does it happen before seven? Does it matter? Well, basically, I mean, to me, if you're really doing work sessions on different topics, you're essentially just changing your meeting time to 6.30 and starting with a work session. It's not, you're, you're uh -huh. getting a new meeting time. Yeah. Um, I know the idea had been thrown out by the solicitor initially about, do you want to, start a half an hour early for purely the purposes of agenda planning, which would be a pretty contained conversation about what are you doing next? Why are you doing it next? Do you want to move this here or there? Um, whereas a different sort of work session each time, um, you're going to have to prep. I mean, that requires more prep work and early but, start time. And it's, it's a different animal. I, that mm -hmm. is not what I had thought Jose was going to be proposing, but Hey, look through throw it on the table. I yeah. Have a, yeah. It, no, I host I just be I mean, we talked about this out briefly and we got together. Um, but I would be interested in what uh, that piece, like who does the planning for it, who does the prep, who decides what the topics would be. Well, for from the conception. from the agenda agenda planning perspective, a lot of it is geared towards the stuff that I'm bringing before council. So a good example is going to be what I've included in my manager's report today, talking about gas aggregation and um, an agraria project. So uh, during my during my perform performance review process, we talked about the value proposition of centering more around around some of our projects, putting council at the center in order to implement that from a process perspective, having that ability to talk about those agenda items that I'm bringing to you down the road gives us that mechanism to say, what is your expectation of that work? What do I need to bring back uh, to council to fulfill your expectations, give you the background information that you need to make informed decisions, and are we heading in the right direction around uh, village goals and objectives? So yes, it centers around uh, agenda, uh, agenda planning, but it, a lot of the agendas have specific topics. And also there are topics, for example, a compost project might be something that we would bring mm -hmm. for a work session. I'm very interested in bringing the climate action, sort of where that stands and have council talk about that. That's something I'd like to do in June. Um, so, and, and in terms of who would prepare, I would, if it's a village manager, bringing the work session i would assume the village manager would repair council member or two council members or council member and let's say if it were the compost way and i would repair something together whomever is working on the issue yeah no i think what i was just trying to get get to is like so how would we decide that we would talk about compost versus talking about i don't know anything like which i think we would do it I would think we would do it at the next part of this agenda. So we would do it like at this meeting when we, you know, do agenda planning and we'd come to some consensus about like, this would be a good topic. So, I mean, I, cause I think if we wait, you know, for the agenda planning meeting, then we're not all involved. So I feel like if we do this, you know, we say, you know, at the end of this meeting, we're gonna do this the next time. What were you thinking, Carmen? I appreciate the proposal. I appreciate the idea, but I think that if we work toward more effective communication, like, so you're talking about a half an hour meeting before every council meeting. Okay. And so what if we have an executive session? We're here at five, <clears throat> five thirty. Mm -hmm. Um, 
you know, I, I think that, you know, I'm, I would, I wouldn't be opposed to having, I mean, pretty much know what's coming down the pike. I wouldn't be opposed to having one once a month, Yep. you know, but, but not every meeting, especially because of stuff like executive session. Yeah, I think when I think about it, like related to my debrief from the last meeting, if I had thought about it, like I would have like maybe spent that time talking about the zoning proposal right. for those 30 minutes, okay. you know, for example. Um, but I like your idea, like we don't have to commit to doing it every, you know, meeting. So, you know, we can, but I, I think we should try it, you know, and see, you know, when we have like topics that we think, um, you know, could use some extra time, so. And so yeah. that should be at the discretion of council or the village manager probably counsel to say hey we need to have a this a this particular meeting not everyone there would be a memo like hey we're going to do the work session thing now instead of and it's the every it's the every meeting part because sometimes we there eh, sometimes i don't think it's necessary sometimes it's more than necessary yep Gavin? I'll just say I do really like the idea of the of agenda planning as being a, a component. So I mean, obviously, we're talking about we're talking about thirty minutes once a month, once a month, and we're trying to also talk about concepts. I mean, this is going to fly by. Oh, but yeah, okay. I did like the agenda planning component of it yeah. Yeah. because um, it does feel a little bit like as somebody's not part of the agenda planning. Yeah. When we get to the meetings and things feel like they're kind of a surprise, or it feels like hasn't been vetted it's like it's hard to know how to respond so to participate in that would be nice the other thing is that's like the short term then i don't feel like we do a very good job of talking about the longer term of how we're doing toward our goals so that piece that host i mentioned resonated with me totally game to start out to try it um i guess a little nervous that it's like what are we, are we doing it as a future agenda planning are we doing it as more time to talk about topics Feels kind of like and it would be lump. it would be changing our meeting times because we can't hang out and talk about anything because it it has to be a public meeting. Correct. So we can call it a work session, but we're having an earlier meeting. An earlier meeting, right? <laughs> yeah, Amy, come on up. So yeah, that's exactly right. It is still a work sessions are still open meetings, and it would still that's be big. subject right. Yeah. It would still be subject to the notice requirements of people for. Um, residents be present. But the other thing that it's useful for is in with, with communities that have work sessions is in staff meetings, right? Because when Josue meets with his department heads, there are ideas floated in those meetings that it's like, well, I don't know, should is that something be nice to have council guidance on where they'd want to go with that. And then a work session gives staff the ability to present something to you preliminarily, not in a way that it's fully baked and on your agenda. Can we do that as needed though? I mean Oh, and nothing has to be set in stone. No, right. nothing yeah, I mean, like, I'm, like I'm on as needed. Sure. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure. on as needed. I don't think that it's necessary to have it every meeting. That's just mine. Yeah. Mine. We can we can try it with once a month, as you propose, Carmen, and we can pick whether that's the first or second meeting uh, of the month, and we see how it goes. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work. It's great, and we'll probably want more of it. I think just uh, being open to it. And even if you decide to do one at the second meeting of the month or whatever, and there needed to be an exec session, well, no work session this meeting. Yeah, there's going to be an exec session instead. Yeah. I'm, it could be I'm, I'm hopeful that it means not staying here until 1130 or having conflict about issues that we can work offline, that it might not be fully there where you expect them to be, or you know, we are doing God's work and ends up we're not. Well, and this is why I guess I kind of connected, you know, council committees to this piece of the agenda, because again, well, I'm glad to hear about the uh, special events committee, because that address uh, would address one of the four topics that mm -hmm. took a lot of time. Um, the YSDC piece, I would have liked that to have been like vetted somehow beforehand. And so I don't know if that means a different committee um you know the housing committee i, I kind of already referenced i understand that it was hard to make a recommendation about you know that particular topic but in general you know i mean 
I think as these kinds of things come up, we should think about, you know, beyond like a work session, which might do the trick, is there a subcommittee that should meet and that's some of that. Yes. So apropos to that, I would like to have time at thinking of work session. Talk about where the climate action work is, where it's gotten stuck, um, what might be some options. And I'd like to do that in, well, probably the second council meeting in June. By that time, I think there'll be a bit more information. I'd like to have it happen at the council table because, um, well, because we're, council is supporting this. So I think we need to have a discussion as council about what, here, here's where things are. What do we want to do? What, where do we want to go from here? Well, maybe that's our first try at a work session. Did you? So, because I think, you know, you've got the environmental commission that can vet this, you know, ahead yes. of time. So, um, so maybe let's tentatively slot that for June. Okay, the second meeting yep. in June. Second meeting in June. Yep. So then I guess my only, that sounds like a topic. I, I would love for, I would like for one of these ones, if we're only going to do one a month and we're going to try out to be like an actual future agenda planning. So that this is one idea. There was, you mentioned the compost thing. You've got, you talked about the agraria thing and the, what was the other one? Gas aggregation. The gas aggregation. Um, but So that is that along the lines of like a goal check-in? I think of? so. Okay. Yeah. Well, let's do that at the next meeting. I mean, I don't think we have an executive session. So why don't we try that for the second meeting in May and then we do very ends in June. All right, let's try it. Okay. Um, all right. Well, I promised that we were going to be out of here by 930. So, um, and I think we're at future agenda items. So yeah. anything we need to think about for future meetings. Okay. So is it okay? Yeah. Okay. So I just, this goes just perfectly in line with what we just talked about on agenda my, item I didn't know was going to be there. I'm just asking all of us to just take a breath right now. And I know we all want to leave, but to actually take a second and do future agenda planning. So if you're seeing something that's complicated, because part of what happens with these agendas is we put 10 meeting, 10 minutes on for something that takes half an hour or something's going to come up that nobody else knows about until we see it at the agenda and we're assuming it's been vetted. So I'm just saying out loud, instead of us rushing out of here, can we all just actually think this through and can people please say if there are things they are expecting to bring up so that we don't get surprised when they come up? So that, Judy, that's a preface to, I know you usually run through stuff, I'm just saying out loud, I really want us to pause and use this time thoughtfully. Cause I think, to me, that's really substantive and not having, um, this, it's been a regular challenge with me. Okay, so do you have some things? No, no, I'm just saying oh. structurally, that's it. No, okay. I, I don't have anything. So, so um, there will be a report uh, about the first phase of the, whatever we're calling the Yellow Springs Police Inquiry. Um, um, and we're going, uh, Kevin and I, well, and I'm, you know, Kevin is facing some significant family issues, so I'm not sure how much he's going to be able to be involved, but the idea is that we will be through with our sort of investigation by the end of May, write up a report, so, but that would still be into June, so I don't have a particular time about that, but that is one thing. The, comp the compost thing, I guess, depending on what uh, Tecumseh Land Trust decides, we'll be able to either move forward or not, but I don't think we have anything to put on the agenda about that at this point. Likewise for the bike trail. No more information at the end of the month. I have a, I'll have a new agenda item. Um, I shared with some of you that I attended um, a training. Uh, Brickler and Eckler actually did the did the infl inflation reduction workshop at the Ohio City Managers Association. So I got the um, the NOFA for charging EV charging infrastructure grant uh, is due at the end of the month, May thirtieth. So we want to explore looking at strategically placing. Uh, EV charging stations throughout the village while also improving infrastructure for future EV uh, implementation. 
The challenge with the grant is that it's a minimum ask of $500,000 with a $100,000 uh, matching funds. Uh, I think that if we can pair it with infrastructure improvements, like replacing a line, uh, a distrib uh, distribution line in the village, we could probably get the benefit of, of infrastructure improvement while also putting out EV uh, charging infrastructure. So we're going to work through it with AMP and uh, um, possibly bring in a, a grant writer uh, from AMP to help on the project. And if we can, if it's feasible, we'd like to bring a request at the May 15th meeting. And is there any option to collaborate with another municipality on this? This one, I, I didn't see a, a regional collaboration on this. It's, uh, this is a uh, federal transportation money. So I don't know, maybe if we were doing a corridor, like if we're doing a, um, I don't know, imagine if we were doing a regional project, is there a midpoint that we can partner with somebody else to, would be a multi-community benefit? Probably, but I don't know the details enough. Because I'm just worried about that 100,000. Well, I mean, the upside is if we can do it with electric improvements, we've got, presumably we've got that in the electric code, so. Right. Is that a future agenda item? That, yeah. It's a resolution. I'm, I'm hearing resolution. Yes, okay. resolution. I'm hearing a lot of information that okay. we need to accompany that resolution, but yes. Yes. This is the benefit of the future hmm. agenda planning discussion items. Okay. You know, today is the first, so we'll so, have... Okay, so then just to say, just to get into practice of this. So then the question becomes like, is this a priority for us? Right. So it's a, that's like a new thing. Yeah. I don't remember us talking about any of that in the context of the, so this is where like rather than sort of it just goes on, ideally we'd have a little bit of time to like look at our goals and then say, is this something that we want to spend time on and make some, so I'm not opposed to it. I'm just saying structurally right. what we end up doing is like shiny penny, shiny penny. Let's just, you know, pause. So I would su suggest like, and if there's no, is there a rush to it? Is there a timeliness to it? May 30th. And May 30th. We can wait until next year if we don't apply this year, if the money is available next year. Okay. So if there's timeliness to it, then I think on the agenda is fine. And then I guess my hope would be that at the next meeting, we start setting some, in that work session time, we start setting some norms around what happens when there's a shiny penny. Okay. Yeah. I'll bring up a different topic. So I see Rex on here, like yeah. renewable energy credit credit policy conversation. So I know it's been a complex conversation in the past. We talked about it a little bit at the finance committee. I guess I'm just this seems like the opportunity to say, hey, are there things that people know they want to see or things they're expecting, so that that isn't an hour long conversation that it is prepared for effectively to be less of one. Is that is is there anything like that that people are expecting? Mm -hmm. Well, what I'm expecting yeah. for Rex is a memo in the packet that we could then like respond to. So that's what I think needs to happen there. So a recommendation. And, right. A recommendation. Right. I mean, this is something that I, I guess I thought if it's not environmental commission, then somebody's got to. No, I don't think it's the environmental commission okay. as constituted. Um, then I guess it can be finance committee. So, but yeah, I think there should be a recommendation that we respond to. Well, I mean, I, I've had conversations with Josue. I mean, I'd like to see, you know, wh why are we selling them now? You know, how, how is it determined when the best time to sell them is? Um, wh what the advantage of buying cheap Rex is and a recommendation of who's to buy because one of our consultants had suggested that you buy recs that are in the area or something that you support and then the options for how the money that we get would be used okay. all right and so the guys who do our gas aggregation i can never remember the name of the group SOPEC. SOPEC. So that'd be, that could be a SOPEC invited thing? SOPEC can so, help with SOPEC that. SOPEC conversation, no, yes, no. Yeah, I've experienced it. Yeah. SOPEC and PCFO, yeah. both of those organizations help with that. Well, the SOPEC, the guy, like one of the guys that was here, that's, only, that's mm -hmm. really the only reason why I mentioned it. Yeah. Okay, so that, is that a future agenda item? Yeah, it's on yes. the, for next, next meeting. Um, and then... We need to 
be more active about our housing initiatives. So, um, so I don't know if there's more to follow up from the housing committee meeting, but it so could also just be, you know. We have another, we have a housing committee meeting this week, I believe. So uh, we got boards and commission report out. So we, the we'll do a, is so, okay. So I think the idea is, is that based on the feedback we've gotten from the people who are not on the committee, which is good, we should plan on that being a 15 minute discussion because it's a huge topic and we're, it's a, I mean, it's, I'm just acknowledging that people want to talk about this and that when we only talk about things for five minutes. So that's going to probably go up to June 5th because right now you are not getting out of here any, anytime soon on the 15th. Okay, so then I, and I guess all I'm saying is, is that we've, we've talked about housing as being our top priority and then we bump it so that we can talk about anyway so just this is the kind of thing i'll hopefully we'll flag going forward um no that's all so so is there a time that housing is going to get discussed is it there's so a housing committee first, and then there's it's going to be one of the commission reports and then i'm just acknowledging no. that it's going to take longer than one so we're talking about the first meeting in june for housing and then so it maybe should it should be more than coming up under committees yeah It'll yeah, be it'll be its own topic. Yeah, there's not enough time for it. Yep. Okay. Anything else? So then, to be clear, like right now, you've got AMP presentation. So is this where we should be looking for, like, so for instance, this thing that came up, the consideration of a PUD. So that wasn't was that something that was flagged in future agenda items last time, or that just came up in agenda planning? No, it's been there. Yeah. Okay, we don't ever spend any time talking about this, so like, sorry. But you, when's the last time we spent more than one minute talking about future agenda planning? Okay, when I send out the draft agenda, is the time for you to say, I don't understand this, what is this? And here's the expectation, is that when we get those, that everything's been vetted. And then when we get here and we have an hour long conversation about something, because either the, because for some reason the conversation hasn't been thorough, that's something that we have, when I see the agenda planning, I'm assuming it's yes. been vetted. I'm assuming that these things have been discussed, that there aren't going to be hour, there's not going to be an hour long worth of discussion. So the reason I'm getting involved now is because that hasn't been happening. Well, it's also because yeah. this council tends to not take recommendations as, as a recommendation, but more as a starting point for discussion. That is kind of how a council is. And so sometimes there's what, what has thought to be a vetted notion and it's put forward and it, it's not quick and people do want more. And then it goes all sideways. And other times, it heads right on down the road, like the PUD on less than five acres. I mean, it's a little unpredictable in that regard. And, and, and not that I totally disagree, but we don't usually have four hour meetings. But I will say. I know. I'm not saying. Right. No, I know, I know. So I'm not disagreeing as much as I would say, like, event fees is an example of, I think, what Judy was saying. Um, we did have a memo. I mean, I understand. I mean, you were actually in the finance committee meeting, so we hadn't talked about that. Um, but we did have a memo. I would argue that it was vetted, but it still took a lot of time. Um, so I, I don't, I don't know that we can always avoid that. Um, you know, YSDC. I think that was a little bit different. Um, I wasn't responsible for that topic. I would have liked it to be better vetted. Um, you know, so anyway, but I, so anyway, I, I generally agree. I would just say, you know, we, it's not easy to always manage it. So. Well, I appreciate this conversation. Yep. I appreciate talking about potential topics. And I, like the last time I made it said that I wanted to, when Judy, when you sent out the uh, agenda, I said, I wanted to talk about um the work session but it didn't get on the agenda so plus saying saying brian had family stuff going on and i didn't want well to make anyway it, it didn't get on so. it and that's different than having a conversation where we we can respond and add yep no i think this is good as well and i think uh i i don't want it to be lost in the shuffle that we get so buried with a million pieces of legislation that we do get away from our goals and so i think that that's a good thing to be reminded of and so maybe we can't do like 20 zoning amendments in a meeting so okay 
Um, all right, well, it is 929. Do we have anything else? All right. So I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. I know. Okay. <laughs> all right, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Okay. Enjoy May Day.